Good morning, everyone. It's 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Brian Sazi. This morning, this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's your morning rundown. It just keeps climbing. Oil extends its rally nearing a $100 a barrel cost on concerns of lower supply and growing demand. Now, the spike in crude causing a headache for central bank officials and that stubborn inflation number and bets on other U.S. interest rate hikes also keep the dollar elevated. Plus, a lackluster quarter from Micron, the U.S. chipmaker furthering near-term losses. But there's a light or maybe a light at the end of the tunnel leadership predicting gross margins will be positive again further into next year. Thanks to a boost from the AI sector. We'll see it just about that. And we're still full speed ahead towards a government shutdown. The House rejected a funding bill advanced by the Senate with no other plan to extend government funding before the October 1st deadline. Hard right Republican holdouts are digging in their opposition to any short-term funding deal and threatening to oust Speaker McCarthy if he makes a deal with House Democrats. Yikes. Yikes is right. All right, today's morning driver, lousy market sentiment. Actually, Brad, it's just pretty awful. Stock searching for direction this morning, struggling to shake off the downbeat mood increasingly hanging over markets here in the U.S. and overseas. The Federal Reserve's higher for longer interest rate projections. China's lackluster recovery and rising credit card delinquencies or just some of the challenges that have weighed on investor sentiment in recent trading sessions. And Brad, it's just ugly, ugly, ugly. And I look right at the, uh, the really good note from the folks over at J.P. Morgan, Marco Kalanovich, talking about there's more headwinds than tailwinds. Uh, another way of looking or, or thinking about that is earnings are probably not going to be good. I think this market is starting to freak out about the higher for longer interest rates. And then, oh, yeah, we might have a government shutdown this weekend. You might see hundreds of thousands of people laid off, not getting a check. Lots of problems for this market. I'm surprised it's not down another 10%. Yeah, it's been interesting, especially with that, knife, that note from JPM and talking about stocks remaining unattractive, where then people would look for perhaps into the fixed income and particularly where we've continued to have conversation with some of our guests about where they're finding quality. We were just talking about this with Gargi Chowdhury of BlackRock earlier this week as well. And so some of the alternative plays, even if people aren't looking at stocks, starting to be even more of the fervor for conversation right now. Right, markets could be really dumb sometimes. And I think back to what we heard from Suntory CEO yesterday, Tak Ninami, telling you that his business in the U.S. is starting to slow. And then while that's happening, Business overseas and that market starting to slow. Asian markets under pressure. You have pressure on Evergrande. You had consumer confidence this week under pressure, disappointing. Micron earnings, you know, weren't that great. Conference call really didn't make me all feel hot and sexy about what's happening from that company over the next six months. So lots to take here. The market has been resilient. But again, I think we enter October with a lot more concerns than positives in terms of catalysts. Yeah, and especially as we go into Q4, if there's anything that's going to make consumers feel hot and sexy, it seems like it's going to be some of the promotions, some of the deep discounts. That's not good for some of the retail companies that we've heard from over the course of this earnings season. And you think about what Nike is also going to need to say around that. That's particularly going to be in focus going forward. That could set the tone for where we see not just companies being able to move through inventory, but what at what average full price they're able to move towards uh, or move through some of that inventory as well. Here. Did I say hot and sexy? You did say I hot did and say sexy. hot and sexy on live yeah. T. Well, you know, anything happens here, uh, you know, at the Nasdaq. Love this space. I'm feeling the energy. But you mentioned Nike earnings out after the close yeah. today, Brad. I, I count at least five analysts over the past two weeks, chopped their estimates, chopped their price targets. They didn't really have a pair in terms of wanting to cut their rating on the stock. But still, by and large, this is a I think a street that is very nervous about the negative signals from a Nike report. Is China slowing? Yeah. We have seen luxury goods stocks under pressure. Uh, Nike will probably see weakness in China. What is happening in the U.S.? We've seen a lot of weak reads on the U.S. consumer here. What does that mean? Our, what is seen through the prism of Nike? Can people go out there, Brad, and afford $175 pair of shoes for this back-to-school shopping season? I fancy they probably can't. Yes, a pair of shoes is what you well, were no, you referring you to earlier. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> you gotta you gotta keep some stuff on your feet, but. Consumer fear. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, unless you're at the beach. But anyway, right now, it's winter in New York, so keep something on your feet. Um, not quite winter. Anyway, folks, consumer fears, that is what is really kind of encapsulating a lot of this conversation. And the conference board this week, as you were alluding to that consumer confidence number, conference board data and some of the additional context around that data.
data saying consumer fears of an impending recession also ticked back up. That consistent with the short and shallow economic contraction that they anticipate for the first half of 2024. Consumers out there that are hearing more calls from economists of a Fed that's going to remain higher for longer, that's certainly continuing to have this, persist, this persistent kind of fear factor that's being inserted into not just the markets, because we saw that reaction last week in the price action after the Fed made their decision and came out uh, with the announcements um, and kind of gave a little bit more inclination as to what they may do further from here through the dot plot. But it's also going to impact the number of consumers that are willy-nilly spending or feeling hot and sexy, as you put it. It's bizarre. It's, Brad, it's bizarre. I know we have to get to Micron. It's bizarre time because you're seeing pre order strong for, for Apple iPhones. These things ain't cheap. Yeah. What are they, $1,200 for these phones? People are buying this stuff. Who is shopping? But... It's just uh, a lot of mixed reasons, the consumer. All right. Well, we'll tell folks later on what you said about the uh, Apple iPhone. If it <laughs> yes, I want to, yes. please. All right. Well, we're also watching shares of Micron Technology. They are sinking in pre-market trading. Investors were hoping for Micron's earnings to rescue the tech sector and other stocks from that September slump. But the chip maker's weak financial results only added to the pressure here. The disappointing news came the day after the S&P 500 tech sector officially hit correction territory, falling 10% from recent highs. The sell-off, fueled by the Fed's hawkish and fear of higher for longer interest rates. Now joining us, we've got Michael Aroni, who is the State Street Global Advisors U.S. Chief Investment Strategist. First and foremost here, when you look kind of broad strokes around the, the equity landscape right now, is there, is there anything that gets you, as Brian Sazi would say, hot and sexy at this point in time? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, listening to you and oh, Brian. Oh, you know it, Brian, Michael. Come on. You're feeling hot and sexy this morning. Come on. I'm, feeling, I'm always feeling hot and sexy, Brian. But listen, I think what's interesting here is that listening to both of you, I'm, I'm reluctant to pile on on the negativity. I'm looking for some silver linings here. Uh, one of the areas that we do like is energy. So energy continues to be supply constrained at a time when we're trying to make this transition from a fossil fuel space economy to something else. The stocks are cheap. They've demonstrated great capital discipline. They're returning both capital through dividends and buybacks uh, to shareholders. And, you know, it looks like OPEC and its partners want to keep supply constrained and prices high. As a result, we think energy shares are kind of interesting at this point uh, of the cycle. And they've been reacting a little bit better of late from that from that standpoint. Yeah, I feel you, Michael. Uh, look, we had yesterday Exxon shares close at a record high. That is uh, catching a bit here in the pre-market. But Let's stay on oil here. We, we have oil prices uh, climbing to near $100 a barrel. Doesn't that raise the risk of just wrecking this economy? I mean, we're slow growth here and, and really taking valuations down even further. I'm trying to understand how is oil at $100 a barrel a positive market catalyst into October? So I don't think it is a positive market catalyst. So on the one hand, I think it's great for energy companies, uh, energy services companies and the like, which is why we like it from an investment standpoint. So Brad saying, hey, Mike, are there any silver linings in the equity space? I think energy is one of those. But here's the thing, Brian, exactly as you're pointing out, I think that really has a negative impact on consumer spending potentially on businesses in terms of business fixed investment. And I do think that that poses a challenge going forward for the economy. So it's interesting, as an equal weighted um, consumer discretionary sector has hit three month relative lows, energy's hitting highs. I think there's some symmetry there. So what's good for energy stocks is probably not good for the consumer. And I would extend that to businesses. And you're seeing that reflected in some of the share prices of late. Uh, and I think that contributes to some of the concerns around the consumer. So that is one of the areas that I flagged. You guys were talking about it in terms of the consumer potential slowdown in spending is a risk to this market, is a risk to the economy going forward. Well, that said, Michael, in your notes to us, you say that the consumer discretionary sector remains attractive. Why is that, especially given what you're saying around how energy could be perhaps this, this overhang or this headwind? So I think this might take a little time to work out. There's a couple of things here. I think first and foremost, everybody, including the Federal Reserve, underestimated the positive impact the consumers and businesses are locked in at very low, late, low rates on their debt obligations, their mortgages and everything else. And now they can earn a competitive risk-free rate of return on money market-like instruments. This positive operating leverage, kind of to use that term, would suggest that this is having a much greater positive impact than anyone anticipated. And it could be the reason why higher interest rates haven't had the bite that they normally have. 
So, Brad and Brian, I think this will take a little while longer to play out. And sure enough, here this morning, what is the market reacting to? Jobless claims continue to come in at incredibly low levels. So everyone who wants a job has a job. As long as that's and companies aren't laying off workers, as long as that continues, I think the consumer will will continue to be a positive for this market. It's just the rate of growth is going to slow as oil rates and, and inflation continue to bite. Fair point, Michael. Uh, you know, you mentioned that earnings estimates, uh, they are starting to come down. Do you think they're going to fall off a cliff? And I'm locking in on, on shares of CarMax today. Stock is getting absolutely obliterated, missed on earnings, terrible quarter, sales down double digits, warning about the impact of higher rates. Does Wall Street remain still too optimistic on the earnings power of S&P 500 companies? Just like we talked about the symmetry between consumer discretionary or the consumer and energy, I think there's some symmetry here as well. So if you think about what really fueled the rally in the first seven months of the year, it was this notion that analysts had ratcheted down their earnings expectations so much because they were anticipating a recession, more companies than normal beat them and they beat them by a wider amount. Brian and Brad, I'm concerned that in the second half of the year, what's happened is the soft landing narrative has really taken hold analysts had become much more optimistic. So now I think we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. So when it comes to earnings, the levels don't matter as much. It's did you beat expectations or did you fail to beat expectations? And I'm concerned that expectations headed into the next two earnings seasons were too high. And as a result, we could be setting ourselves up for some disappointment. And here we are, Micron, as you mentioned, is a bit of a disappointment. So I do think that this is a risk going forward. Michael Aroni, State Street Global Advisors, U.S. Chief Investment Strategist. Always good to see you. Stay hot and sexy this weekend. We'll talk to you soon. All right, the second GOP primary debate kicked off last night. Candidates weren't shy in voicing their thoughts on former President Trump's absence, but also covered everything from the government shutdown to the state of the economy. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis told voters, we've got to address the underlying problem with Bionomics, the overspending, taking all Biden's rules and regulations, I'm going to throw them in the trash can on one day. You're not going to have to worry about that. And Nikki Haley made her thoughts on the government shutdown quite clear, saying Congress has only delivered a budget on time four times in 40 years. If they don't keep the government open, they should not get paid. No pay, no budget. Yahoo Finance senior columnist Rick Newman joins us now. Rick, I know you must have enjoyed uh, this debate. Some of your top takeaways, you always write about Bodynomics. Bodynomics was very much under attack at this second GOP uh, debate. I watched this uh, horror show so that nobody else has to. Um, honestly, <laughs> this debate was terrible. Uh, first of all, the moderators just absolutely did a terrible job. Uh, keeping these uh, debaters under control. People were shouting at each other. You could not tell what anybody was saying. Uh, and there is a transcript, so you can go back and figure out what people actually said. Um, look, D Donald Trump's strategy is working. Um, he, he has turned these debates into a complete sideshow by not showing up. And uh, honestly, I think I think the Republican side needs to reconsider this whole format because it's not really I don't think it's really helping anybody try to figure out what's going on with these candidates. You know, in terms of, you know, a couple takeaways who won or lost, uh, I guess Nikki Haley does appear to be the uh, adult in the room. She's getting pretty good reviews. It's clear that uh, the candidates who are left, the seven who are left, they all kind of focus their fire on Vivek Ramaswamy because uh, he kind of came out of nowhere in the first debate. So they did their opposition research on him. They figured out some ways to ding him. They said he uh, hasn't had investments related to the comp Chinese Communist Party, uh, and he did not do so great last night. And uh, my best guess is that Doug Burgum, who is the uh, people still probably don't know who Doug Burgum is, the governor of North Dakota, I think he's going to fall off soon. Um, he actually has the kind of resume our audience would like. He was an executive at Microsoft. Uh, he represents a business community, um, but he just does not connect at all. Um, he, he, he speaks in um, minute detail about stuff that just I can't imagine people care about, such as explaining to us what rare earth minerals are last night. Um, <laughs> just, I, I cannot ever say anybody should watch one of these debates ever again, honestly. Yeah, I think our viewers would care for for my care more for my definition of a level two EV charger as I broke down <laughs> yesterday on the show here, Rick. But even as we think about where the debates go from here, what are the top topics that still have yet to be discussed? Uh, well, I, I think the way you might frame that is that have yet to be discussed in any kind of meaningful detail because 
Hmm. Um, the moderators actually did ask some meaningful questions, um, but you know, they that doesn't mean the candidates answer. Uh, you know, I think the most famous evasion from last night was uh, they asked Mike Pence um, if Obamacare is here to stay, and he answered by talking about the death penalty. Um, so one thing you are not getting from Republicans is any, they, I, I don't think any of the Republicans have anything to say about health care. Uh, they used to want to kill Obamacare. They tried to do that during the Trump administration. They couldn't do it. So now what do they have? They got nothing on health care. Um, the other thing that they are doing is um, really uh, taking shots at Biden's green energy plan. Uh, Mike Pence calls this the Green New Deal, it is not the Green New Deal. Biden was actually against the Green New Deal. But they um, are trying to now to sort of lampoon and vilify electric cars. Um, Trump is doing this, too. Um, I, we'll see how Biden defends himself on that. The facts about electric cars are that people are buying them because they want them. But if you don't want an electric car, you don't have to buy one. Um, so uh, there are all these attacks on green energy, like let's just go back to, you know, giant gas guzzlers of the of the 1970s. Um, we'll see if what kind of traction that gets with voters. I don't feel like it's getting very much at all. And thus, my explainer on level two EV battery chargers will still remain relevant. Thank you so much, Rick, yeah, for bringing that full circle three, for man. us. Yeah, I'm going to try. I'm going to try my best. I got to get a car first. Thanks so much, Rick. Appreciate it. Bye, guys. Well, though missing from the debate last night, former President Donald Trump still stands far ahead of the competitors, with the latest polling from Reuters Ipsos showing Trump at 51 percent, 37 percent of his closest competitor, Governor Ron DeSantis. So what could be done to shift the tides of Republican nomination? Caden Dawson, who is the former chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party and surrogate for the Nikki Haley campaign, joins us now. Thanks for taking the time here with us this morning here. What should business leaders who were watching the debate last night take away about this Republican Party and where their interests for, for business actually stand? Sure. I, I, I agree with just about everything our last guest said. Guys, it's really a real pleasure to be on with you. Uh, us on the street call you the bees and I always want to know what you're saying in the mornings because it is right. What I will tell you is all you need to do is watch your show and watch the tickers and understand it really doesn't matter which one of the seven or eight on the stage uh, or what they did specifically. Watch what you said this morning. Look at the tickers. Look where the economy is. Look at somebody like me that on today, a year ago, I took my fortune out of the stock market and put it in CDs uh, today and doing it again because the, the, the optimism is not there. All the numbers that you're showing on your show Everything you're doing makes me want to crawl underneath the desk and hide. So Joe Biden and the Democrat Party is in charge and they are in trouble. With that said, the debate last night was a West Coast debate. None of the early states really saw it in that time frame. It was a little convoluted and a, a debate that seemed to be unorganized. But Nikki Haley did a great job. Uh, uh, Mike Pence over on the side. Uh, when you when you look at it, you got to look at somebody like Nikki who earned her way on the stage. Nobody really ever gave her anything. You, you sure. look at DeSantis who needed a breakout. He he he. When you when you break it down, guys, you look at the optics of how they look, what they did, how they carried themselves, and then let's see what the spin is around it. Nikki will do well. There, there's probably one person that's uniquely different on the stage than Donald Trump, and that's Nikki Haley. That's probably who he's the most worried about going head up. He'll show up in the next debate, and that will get rid of another three. Uh, so I'm encouraged with what I see. I'm discouraged by where the economy is. I'm discouraged with the price of gasoline. I, I, I ran my own businesses for 37 years and then sold them and got in a political consulting Kate, and was chairman Kate, of a political party. So Kate, my point on know, all of that now, Tribe, is, is watch your show, see what you're saying, and yep. put that to the electoral college and the next, the next president's going to be a republic. Kane, okay, that's, you know, well, one, of course, thank you for your loyal viewership. Uh, we really appreciate it. But number two, the millions of people watching Yahoo Finance, you're dealing with higher gas prices, uh, their consumer cut, they're feeling less certain if the government is going to be open this weekend. Uh, and as they surveyed that debate stage last night, none of them really sounded strong. None of those candidates sound strong on the economy. Doesn't that strengthen the hand uh, of former President Donald Trump, because a lot of people watching this, 
They remember what the stock market did under Donald Trump. They remember that energy prices were a little bit lower under Donald Trump. Doesn't that just raise his profile even more? Maybe he is smart by not being on that stage. You've made a wonderful point that sometimes you don't have to say anything to take credit for what happened. Uh, you know, you throw the pandemic in there. You're right. Donald Trump has a story to tell. My argument with Donald Trump is he hadn't told it. And maybe he's got plenty of time to tell it instead of getting in all the minutia, staying in courts and all the lawsuits and everything that goes on. But you're correct. This, this failing economy that we're in, especially in working America, where the prices have been inflated beyond affordability, is things that move elections. It moves voters. Uh, and from what I see in your show that I'm a loyal viewer, is there's no hope in the summer uh, when everybody's going to be getting ready for a, for a general election that things are going to be a whole lot better. And it, it's the old thing that, that they said, are you, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Any Republican can say that, and it's going to do pretty good. The question is, is the baggage that the former president brings with him, the personal baggage and the personality, let's see how that plays out. And let's see if America's ready to change generations in the presidency. We're going to have two guys the, that are going to be 80-something years old. That's going to be a, a real issue, gentlemen. I think it's a real issue all the way across. I, yeah, I won't go down kind of the, the ageist rabbit hole here, but it is a very valid point in that they are old. Um, at the end of the day, when you think about <laughs> the attacks that have been made against public corporations, free market, and we discussed with former Vice President Pence how he would take a stance or how he would essentially just lean back towards some of the old Trump-Pence policies or Reaganomics and have more free market so that there is less kind of interference within um, the CEOs that are running and that have all of the companies that are of the ticker symbols that are floating around us right now. All that said, for those CEOs who are watching this debate and trying to figure out, okay, how do we avoid being a Disney? How do we avoid being a Target or a Bud Light? Is there anything that they can see from this debate that says if there was one of these people on stage elected or the person who didn't show up, that they would be able to avoid, avoid those scenarios? I, th I, think you can, I think you can look at the Nikki Haley's. I think you can, you can, you can look at some of the other people to understand that, that these are free market Republicans to a point. I, I think the other thing besides the CEOs who are watching this is we in the political world are watching those Main Street businesses. We're watching that, that's where our voters are. Those small businesses are our voters. The big businesses is what pays for our retirements and does everything surround us and supplies us the goods we need. But the Main Street folks are taking it on the chin. It's hard. It's, it, it, it's, you, you were right so true earlier in the broadcast about the interest rates are, are holding everything together because they've got locked in 15s, 20s, and 30s, and they're locked in in the twos, threes, and fours. My, my point with that is, that as you refinance or as you try to grow your business, if you're doing it on capital, the cost of capital has raised, the cost of goods have raised, and I'll give, you, I'll close with this. I have a really big client who called me yesterday and said, I have one requirement for new workers and I'm paying $19.25 an hour, and I, have one, and I need 19 new workers to add to my 1400 I have one requirement. Can you pass a drug test? The first six that came in had to walk out. That's telling. That's telling. So the labor market is, if you want a job, you got a job. That's good for our politics. If you're, but at the end of the day, I'll close with this, guys. I watched it. I wanted to crawl under the desk one more time when I saw all the numbers, all the things you gave me, which is all true. And that's the wonderful part about your show. It is all true. And, and, and it tells you that there is going to be a seismic shift. The politicians in charge are going to get blamed for this next November. That's what's going to happen. You can write that down in the book. Hey, that's what we do here at Yahoo Finance there, uh, Kate, we deal in truth. But bring on that third debate, Kate Dawson, former chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party and surrogate for the Nikki Haley campaign. Good to see you. Appreciate your time, sir. Thank you, guys. All right. All your markets uh, live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. Uh, do stay tuned. Much more ahead on Yahoo Finance. Brian, I'm psyched to be here. You're hyped? Yeah. I couldn't tell.
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Can. I'm Brad Smith with Brian Sazi at the NASDAQ. We've got uh, just inside of five minutes until the market open. Let's take a look at what stocks are doing in the pre-market. We've got Yahoo Finance's own Jared Blickery back again here at the NASDAQ market side with us. You've got the heat map globally. Yes, we got the global heat map and we're seeing a risk off in the West here in the United States. Dow off just marginally. NASDAQ down one third of a percent. And we know volatility has picked up recently. I just want to show you something real quick. This is uh, the Dow year to date. Guess what? It's only up by 1.22% and the Russell 2000 up 1%. So the Dow and the Russell 2000, the small caps, basically flat. So I think that's an interesting development. Uh, but I want to take a look at some of our heat maps here. This is the NASDAQ 100. And up in the upper left, we see Apple is down about half a percent in the pre-market, down 89 basis points yesterday. I want to chart what's happened over the last three months and especially show what happened yesterday because I've been following the descent and we got a breakdown yesterday. So we'll have to see if this is a false breakdown. But two closes under that line pretty much mean to me that Apple has farther down to go. And if Apple's going down, so is the general market, probably. And ahead of your discussion here, I just wanted to share one thing with Apple. This is what Apple stock tends to do each month of the year. You can see September, well, living true to its historical tendencies there. We're seeing a downdraft. October tends to be the best month, but before everybody gets their hopes up, I would say uh, August was supposed to be a positive month as well. That did not pan out. So when seasonality is bucked, that can mean something different is under uh, foot here. So let me just go through some of the pre-market heat maps. I'm gonna begin with the sector action. Energy was on top yesterday, but this morning it's materials, healthcare, and utilities. Industrials also showing some uh, green in there. Uh, not a lot, though, so I'm not going to put too much stock in that. want to check out what's been happening with the uh, energy sector, and we can see kind of a mixed board, although the two majors in the U.S., Chevron and Exxon, each down half a percent. Exxon, as we've been talking about or are going to be talking about, uh, just notched a record high only yesterday. And then finally, here is the banking sector, and we can see mostly green, but not a lot of big outperformers. UBS about half up about half a percent in the pre-market, guys. Yeah, really a great breakdown uh, on Apple. And that really brings up uh, really a hot and thorny issue this morning here that is making some news about iPhones potentially getting too hot. And I, I joked to the Yahoo Finance newsroom this morning, I'm okay with that because I could just flip it over and fry some eggs on the back of it. As long as it gives me that <laughs> new functionality and the battery lasts longer than this three, four year old phone I have, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it, guys. It's a 12? Uh, 13, I think, 12 or 13. Okay, doing yeah. well. No, I didn't do the upgrade cycle. No. Doing good. All right, you've got the historical returns by month there, Jared. Just briefly, let's, let's yeah, go through that. Yeah, and I'll tell you what. I, mean, I just showed this. I want to show you a different way of looking at it. Yeah. If you invested $1,000 in 1981 in each of these months, in each of these months only, here's what you would have. Oh. You can see January up 217%. Uh, June is the first negative month. That's down 72%. But guess what? September, you would have lost 92% of your money. If you invested $1,000, you would have $80 today if you only bought Apple in and, September. And, and of course, Jared, today you're worth about $500 million, right? Because you got it. Well, you bought that in 81. Well, yeah. Well, I okay, mean, great. give or take $100 million, so Okay, yeah. fair enough. Right. He's a uh, October player. Uh, <laughs> he's, uh, of course, looking through the uh, fall classic there for Apple. Uh, Jared, thanks so much. Let's stay on Apple, though, for a hot second here. We got the opening bell coming up, but as we're continuing to take a look at shares kind of going in to the start of today's trading activity, uh, we're, we're seeing a move lower fractionally for Apple. But one thing that I do want to focus in on is that there's been 
been this kind of counter cyclical move here that Apple is seeing versus some of the other smartphone shipments out there. And IDC noting that from an OS perspective, they're expecting iOS shipments to see 1.1% growth in 2023 to reach an all-time high share of 19.9% as iOS continues to remain more resilient to macro challenges than Android. Yeah, we're coming up against that opening bell here. Really, look, uh, the pre-orders for iPhones, Brad, look pretty darn good. Maybe not hot and sexy, but good by all the analyst commentary we're hearing. Well, it's going to be sweaty on the back with that battery <laughs> yes, over here. Yes, it is. For sure. <laughs> Everyone, there's a look at the opening bell on Wall Street. Let's do a quick check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade here as we were a little mixed coming into the start of today's trading activity. You're taking a look at the U.S. markets, uh, the Dow and the S&P 500, at least right now, opening in negative territory. You're seeing red for the Dow, flat just barely to the downside. We'll see if that can get right. And then S&P 500, you're seeing that to the downside by about one-tenth of a percent. The Nasdaq composite here as we open up on the day's activity looks like it's just barely holding on to some gains. And actually, uh, as things calibrate, we see that move lower by about four-tenths of a percent. So that's the actual open that we saw there. Let's bring back in Jared Blickery. Jared, what else are you watching in the sectors here today? Well, the leaders today are a little bit defensive, so risk off here. Utilities and healthcare, that's XLU and XLV in the upper left. Those are the leaders, followed by real estate, so that's interest rate sensitive, also somewhat of a defensive sector. So really not a, a risk on flavor to the markets. We've had those big drops recently. Yesterday tried to bounce back a little bit, um, but we are in a situation now, it's called short gamma. The dealers in the options community are exacerbating the moves just because of the structure of the market and especially the options market when we go down and up those moves are exaggerated uh, so we are seeing heightened volatility here and just thinking about the tech sector that is the biggest loser of the day I want to take a look inside so we're going to take a look at uh, semiconductors first you can see more red than green Nvidia down just barely but ASML down about one and a half percent Micron after those earnings yesterday that's down about 4.8 percent and let's just chart year to date what's going on with uh, Micron here and see if we can get that up, maybe a one year of work. There we go. You can see it is at the bottom end of a trend, trend channel right here. So either we break down or we might get some mean reversion and head back up. But uh, this is a very cyclical stock and some of the guidance might have been a little bit stronger. Did beat the street estimates, but th some people looking for a knockout did not happen. Uh, let's switch over to the software sector and you can see a lot of red here. Workday down 10.75%. And let me just take a look on some of, at some of our leaders and sentiment indicators, IPO and crypto up top. Those are the number one and two, followed by solar, retail, gambling. Um, so not a lot of movement here. I'm not going to read too much into it. I do want to close with the VIX and seasonality. We've seen a rise in the VIX. Guess what? It tends to rise this time of year into October 12th. And that means we can see some downside pressure for a couple of weeks here. Jared, great work uh, as always uh, at the big board. VIX, Apple, you name it. Jared Blickery, thanks so much. We appreciate it. All right, so let's uh, lock in on one stock mover this morning, or should I say how it's spinning. Who write this stuff, Brad? Did you write that for me? <laughs> I did. That no, wasn't all right, me. We're, all right. We're looking, uh, we're looking at Peloton shares. This comes after Peloton Lululemon announced a partnership on fitness content and apparel. The five-year partnership will make the clothing brand the primary athletic apparel provider for the content brand. Uh, and Brad, is no surprise, I have strong views on this. Of course, the market is embracing it. Now, Peloton shares initially popped 30% plus on this news. You have seen some of those gains give back because I think the market is realizing, you know what, maybe this news isn't that mind-blowing for a Peloton, this is a company that continues to lose large sums of money, continues to lose a large amount of subscribers. And oh yeah, because of this deal, probably Peloton's not gonna end up in the Nike family, probably not going to end up in the Amazon family. So I think that is very uh, not good to see if you're a, a remaining Peloton bull. And then secondarily too, the fact that you now have to outsource your apparel to Lululemon, I think that tells you that the Peloton brand uh, may not be as strong as the executives pulling in those big checks of Peloton think. Here's the thing. If I look at this from a Lululemon perspective, there are a few wins here. One, it allows you to sunset a failed mirror acquisition. And, you know, regardless of how you're looking at this, uh, yeah, you're, you're breathing a sigh I, I'm of I'm going to let you finish because I need to say something. Yeah? You go, go, go. Well, go look, what investor is going to say that it was a successful acquisition? And, of course, they bought it at the height of the in-home fitness trend when everybody was at home. Major bet that Lululemon made, paid, what, $500 million for the company. And at the end of the day, I think investors were questioning, all right, when is this actually going to be accretive to the business? When is this going to produce some of the bottom line that we were expecting? That didn't happen. Added perk for Lulu membership program, though. So this is good for Lulu on that side there. Um, 
But here's the other thing, and it's interesting on the instructor side. They pay a lot for these instructors, whether it's, who's your favorite instructor again? All of them, Jess Sims. All of Jess Sims, okay, yeah. you like Jess Sims. Allie, uh, okay, somebody said Cody in my ear. Um, uh, Allie Love is always around Brooklyn. She does a lot of the stuff at the Barclays Center Big games. Fan. So um, awesome. Big fan there. But they retain all the instructors, but you would imagine that the Lulu specific instructors, because some of the instructors have their own athletic apparel and footwear deals on the side. So you would imagine some of the Lulu instructors, if this deal is structured correctly, would be prioritized in the content that the Lululemon members would be tapping into that Peloton has on the digital side. All right. Brad, top analysis. I need to take a moment of meditation on live global TV right now, channeling that inner Peloton meditation app that I use all the time because uh, and then also channel a little bit of Chris Christie and, and talk right to Calvin McDonald, the CEO of Lululemon. It's that one. You blew $500 million, my man, on Mirror at the top of the acquisition. That is $500 million that could have been spent on share buybacks, building a new facility, giving workers a raise. That was a terrible, terrible, awful, just abysmal acquisition by Lululemon CEO Calvin McDonald. Not good use of cash. Now, he's getting a pass, Brad, mm -hmm. because Lululemon, that core business of apparel, he has done a good job operating that. But to see a CEO who signed off on a $500 million acquisition that was worth nothing is horrible. That is absolute mismanagement, board failure, you name it. So for him, I mean, he may not care about it, but you know that is a big knock on his resume at Lululemon. I just have strong feelings about that. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, Brad. Calvin, just well, so you know, Sazi was wearing a Lululemon top in the office yesterday. Yeah, the, I, look, the apparel is the great. great. I, I think yeah. they make some of the best apparel in the game, and it is because of Calvin's efforts. But still, when you send essentially $500 million in shareholder capital right into the toilet, as Calvin did, uh, you know that that's not good. Now, he may not have to pay for that with his job, but still, you don't want to see that if you're if you're uh, an outside or you're an investor in Lululemon because it's just a lack of trust. Sure. All right, we got to talk Carmax. Yeah, let's go uh, Carmax shares. They're getting run over after the company's quarter at four flat tires. Shares in focus today uh, under pressure. Company releasing their second quarter fiscal 2024 results. Net revenues down. Earnings under pressure. Used car sales under pressure. And Brad, I encourage everybody watching this right now, go to the Carmax Investor Relations uh, page. Open up the company's earnings release, scroll halfway down the page, and you will see an explanation of why their sales and profits were under so much pressure. Higher interest rates, and we've been talking about it all morning long. The market mood is souring because we might now be seeing the lagged effects on corporate America of all of these rate hikes from the Federal Reserve. Uh, essentially, CarMax is saying to investors, uh, the cost to own a new car, to finance a new car, has gotten prohibitively expensive because of rate hikes, yeah. and people are not buying, and that is a big problem. And that is something we're also seeing, to a lesser extent, on credit card uh, credit card operations from major retailers. Right. BFA out early this week with a note sounding the caution bell on Nordstrom because of weakening credit conditions. Yeah, a few numbers here, uh, just to kind of put that on the context that you were mentioning a moment ago. Total wholesale vehicle unit sales decreased 11.2% during the quarter. That came in at about 141,000 yes. versus the prior year's second quarter. Sequential improvement from the year over year declines in the second half of last year and this year's first quarter. All that said, other sales and revenues declined by about 5.7% compared with the same quarter last year. Also decreased primarily driven by a decline in this extended protection plan revenues reflecting the effect of the decline in retail unit sales. So all of this comes back to the declines in retail unit sales at the end of the day, as well as some of the widespread inflationary pressures that they mentioned, higher interest rates, tighten lending standards. All of these things are going to impact any type of mindset that a customer has going into a major buying decision like a vehicle, whether it be new or used, and prolonged uh, low consumer confidence they're also citing played a role during this quarter. I know there's a lots of investors, uh, lots of things for investors to be watching right now. We have the debate, we have various market notes, but I just think this single earnings report for a company like CarMax that touches so many households and so many different areas and lines of business, it's probably one of the most important things or more, most important documents I will have read when this week is over. I think that report is very telling on what we could be looking at this coming earnings season. Well, people don't have to watch the debate. We've got our own Rick Newman to do that for <laughs> yeah, you. Thanks, Spare Rick. Spare you the expense here. Let's shift gears here and talk a little GameStop on the day. Taking a look at shares of GME. Shares are higher by about 2.4%. The company announced this morning that they are naming Ryan Cohen as chief executive officer. This comes three months after the GameStop fired their last CEO. The billionaire bought a stake of GameStop in 2020 and joined the board a year later during the height of the meme stock phenomenon. What we should also note is that he will not be taking a salary in this role. Oh, but well, that's mighty nice of him. Congrats. Yes, wow, that that's, doesn't matter to you, I know. No, it's ridiculous. Uh, here's another executive um, that by and large 
know, people have strong feelings about Ryan Cohen, um, that he's failed at GameStop. And I think all signs pointed to him, Brad, taking uh, this CEO role. He has really a, a board of uh, his own hand-picked puppets, puppets, people that he used, uh, he's hand-selected to join that board, that he worked with at Chewy, people that he feels comfortable with. He, they are unlikely to tell Ryan Cohen no. But by and large, zoom out of this situation, and you have Ryan Cohen, who has fundamentally failed at changing a company like GameStop. And why? Because there is no change in GameStop, Brad. This is a fundamentally challenged market. You have digital downloads, you name it. And I know there's a lot of really hardcore believers remaining out there on Reddit and the GameStop story and Ryan Cohen, but he has absolutely failed at fixing this company. All he's done is successfully laid off a lot of former Amazon workers. A top trending ticker on Yahoo Finance this morning, GME, and of course, as it naturally is, especially on a move like this, uh, this is gonna be effective immediately, we should note. And then additionally here, you, you had a question, what the actual trajectory from a strategic perspective is from GameStop at this point in time. I mean, inventory is largely shifting to being delivered over the cloud. You've got a deal that's gonna be done perhaps, and, and, sh and is expected to be done, if you were to look at shares of Activision Blizzard at this point, expected to be done between Microsoft and Activision Blizzard, that's going to just further consolidate the gaming landscape as well. So where does GameStop sit within that, where you've got so many people just going to the cloud to make purchases, it just makes them a t-shirt company or a t-shirt retailer at the end of the day, and maybe you can get a couple Funko dolls Well, Although no, maybe Calvin McDonald over at Lululemon could take all those unsold mirror devices and just stick them into GameStop, Brad, and maybe we can liquidate them that way. There's thousands of GameStop stores. I know, you're thinking, we're thinking in real time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is innovation right here. All right, we're going to go to break. Uh, we have lots more market analysis straight ahead live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. It's a little dark, but we're cooking with gas here this, uh, what, Thursday morning? Yeah, Thursday it's morning. Sexy. Let's do it. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy rejected the Senate's bipartisan stopgap spending bill on Wednesday night, likely increasing the chances of government shutdown this weekend. Meanwhile, McCarthy is working on getting a few holdouts from his party to agree to his spending bills. Amid all the back and forth, our next guest sees a 100 percent chance of the government shutting down this weekend. Joining us now is Douglas Holtz, Aiken, former Congressional Budget Officer Director. Always great to get some time with you. Uh, Doug, uh, before we even really dig into the ramifications of a government shutdown, however long it might uh, extend, what is your takeaway from, from that GOP debate tonight? We've been talking to a lot of folks this morning. No real contender is sticking out. Perhaps that fuels the hand of a Donald Trump, but I uh, would love to get your take. Well, I think that is the right take. Um, th this was a debate that didn't move the needle very much. The, uh, Mr. Trump went in with a pretty large lead. Nobody separated themselves from the others on that stage. 
Uh, and, and really, it was more of the same. I think, you know, Nikki Haley continues to look strong and and uh, confident, but not gaining on Mr. Trump. And, and that's the real message out of the debate. OK, so of what you heard in the debate, did anybody seem concerned about a shutdown and why should they be? Uh, I did not hear a great concern about the shutdown. Um, I think the biggest reason to be concerned is this reinforces the view of the, the Fitch rating agency and others that the U.S. does not have the capability of managing its finances. And that's not a message that you want to send to global capital markets. And Doug, you said you see a 100 percent chance of a, of a shutdown. What is the probability on another credit rating for this country? And I think a lot of folks are trying to understand what are just continuing contentious uh, discussions like this around government shutdowns going back several years ago, what is it doing to the, the confidence in the U.S. financial system? Well, first of all, you know, I think the reason we're going to get shut down is pretty simple. If you look at the, the proposals so far, there's nothing that can pass the House with 218 Republican votes that will pass the Senate. So there's no path to, to, to law at this point. Uh, and the main reason for that is that there's no reason for Democrats to save the Republicans from themselves in the House the first time around. Once that happens, it's a very different story. Uh, so I don't expect a long shutdown. Uh, the, the government shuts down, and at that point, the Senate writes a bill that is uh, consistent with the White House's goals. Uh, it goes over to the House, and lots of Democrats vote for it. They jam it through, and the president signs it. So there, there's a path to funding the government with this, with this hiccup. And so I don't think global investors are going to be terribly shaken by a two, three, one week uh, uh, shutdown. Uh, it's just not a good news story, but it's not terrifically bad news either. If we were to see a shutdown that lasted past a week, two weeks even, then who would be the biggest loser in that scenario? Well, I think the biggest loser in that scenario are uh, the U.S. troops. Uh, unlike past situations like this, there has been no provision to pay the troops during the shutdown. And it's a disgrace to not uh, take care of the U.S. military for those who are defending the values of this country. I, I view that as an enormous uh, error on the part of the Congress and, and something they should not be proud of. Then there's the, the sort of nuisance value for everybody in the United States. You, know, you can't renew your passport. Uh, if, if you needed flood insurance to, uh, to close on your new home, you can't get the insurance policy, can't close on your home. Uh, there's just a slew of basic government services. Exporters can't get licenses, um, which which won't happen and which will interfere with the conduct of normal economic and, and personal affairs. Doug, at the heart of really this debate, I would argue is the, this fact that I mean, this country just still has too much debt and they continue to seemingly add at it at every single turn. How concerned are you about this country's debt? Very. Um, uh, this country has a, a, a real threat from the, the outlook for the federal budget, for fiscal policy. Uh, it is a good thing for there to be a discussion about the debt. It's high, it's rising. Under the, the current laws, uh, it will it will just continue to rise. And is, we're on an unsustainable trajectory. That's, that's the terrible thing. The bad news about this debate is it's focused on the wrong part of the budget. It's focused on the annual appropriations to fund the government. The real issue is entitlement spending. We'll spend $80 trillion over the next 10 years, if my old shop, the CBO, uh, is right. And of that, $50 trillion will be entitlement spending. Only $20 trillion will be the things they're fighting about right now. So the real issue is how do you make Medicare and Social Security financially sustainable over the long term? And I'll just point out, this isn't just uh, you know green eye shades uh, a view of the world. If you're 55 and planning to retire in 10 years, you have no idea what your Social Security check's going to look like. You can't make a reasonable financial plan. That's disgraceful. Social Security is past due for getting fixed by the Congress. Medicare is the same thing. So uh, that's what the debate has to be. That's what I want to hear people on uh, a debate stage talking about in Simi Valley. That's what I want to hear the president talking about. And so far, his message has been, I'm not touching it. That's unacceptable. We only got 30 seconds left. Is there any elected official that you've heard put forward an actual solution when it comes to cutting into the national debt? Um, there is one person talking about reforming Social Security, and that's Senator Cassidy from Louisiana. Uh, he seems to be a quite lonely voice at this point. So uh, I hope the chorus rises in the, in the weeks and the months to come. Doug holtz Aiken, who is the former Congressional Budget Office Director, thank you so much for taking the time here with us today. Certainly do appreciate thank it. You. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back, everyone. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. We're coming to you live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. In lieu of attending last night's debate, Donald Trump visited a non-union factory in Michigan where he slammed Biden's electric vehicle mandate. Take a listen. Biden's cruel and ridiculous electrical. Think of this. He wants electric vehicle mandates that will spell the death of the U.S. auto industry. You know, it doesn't matter. I watch it. You're negotiating a contract. You're all on picket lines and everything. But it doesn't make a damn bit of difference what you get, because in two years, you're all going to be out of business. You're not getting anything. I will not allow, under any circumstances, the American automobile industry to die. I want it to thrive and to thrive like never before. And there you heard Trump speaking until he was orange in the face. Joining us now with what's on his radar, Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. Uh, so an electric vehicle is coming to kill you anytime, uh, anytime soon. That is basically Trump's message. Um, I, I don't know what to say, uh, but we have to pay attention to this because when, when uh, Donald Trump generates a new lie, he tends to say it over and over and over again. So I just want to go through a couple of things Trump is saying falsely about electric vehicles. Um, firstly, he says they're all going to be made in China. Um, I, I guess what he's trying to get at is that the, a lot of the battery technology uh, is based in China right now, and it's just cheaper in China. But this green, the green energy laws that Biden signed last year have uh, powerful tax incentives uh, for manufacturers to put those factories in the United States, battery factories and uh, electric vehicle assembly factories, all the components. And that's actually happening. I mean, there's a boom in U.S. factory construction, um, and that is related to those uh, to those tax incentives for green energy. So they're not all going to be made in China. Um, they're also not mandated. I mean, there's nothing in any Biden policy that says anybody has to buy an electric vehicle. Um, it, it so happens that Americans want to buy electric vehicles. They've gone from almost no market share to I think it's now nine percent of all electric vehicles sold, and that's just because. People want to buy them and get the tax credit along with that. Um, he's also saying union jobs are going to disappear in two years. Uh, in other words, you better elect Trump or all the union jobs are going to go away. I don't think so. And in that speech, he also said, we have unlimited gasoline in the United States, and we have had unlimited gasoline here for 500 years, 500 years, he said. And so I guess the um, original pioneers, they came to the United States in search of unlimited gasoline, um, and they found it. Uh, we don't really have unlimited gasoline. We're limited by the uh, by the refining capacity we have. But that is Trump's speech, and I have a feeling he's going to repeat it. So get used to hearing it.
<laughs> Absolutely, Rick. You know, of course, uh, you write a lot about Bionomics for us, and you're a longtime uh, car car person. So, has the transition to EVs been been good for the U.S. economy under Biden? Has it been a good thing, net net? I, I think it all depends on whether you think we need to solve uh, the problem of global warming. I mean, let's remember why this is all happening. Um, the science is very clear. I mean, we, we keep hitting record after record, the warmest uh, year on record. We know why. It's because of carbon emissions. And um, cars, automobiles, are a major source of carbon emissions. So the reason we're doing this is not just to have electric vehicles for the sake of electric vehicles. It's because electric vehicles have no pollution. So if you, uh, if you don't like electric vehicles as part of the solution, then what is your solution? That is the real question. And if you're just going to say we should ignore global warming, I think uh, th that is um, pretty retrograde at this point. But honestly, that is Trump has no, has no uh, policy at all on what to do about electric vehicle, excuse me, about global warming. So um, if you just want to say we should just, you know, the smokestack should just belch the way they did in the 1970s, which is the Trump kind of view of the world, drill, 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 everything should run on petroleum. Um, and we should ignore global warming, then why do you need electric vehicles? But look, we do need to address this problem. And I think so far, this has been a reasonable solution. And by the way, what is always the number one top ticker at Yahoo Finance? Everybody knows it is Tesla, which is not a government agency. It is a rocket ship company uh, that stock-wise that is making billions of dollars because they make electric vehicles that people want to buy. So there is a market for this. And uh, I think it's foolish to ignore that. Or, or, Rick, you just burn coal like uh, Vivek uh, reiterated last night. Maybe Vivek get uh, coal-powered cars. Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, um, coal has made a bit of a comeback, believe it or not, um, because of everything that happened with displacement in the uh, energy business last year with regard to the Russian invasion and, gas and uh, natural gas shortages and stuff like that. Um, but even in coal country, even in West Virginia, they know that coal's days are numbered. Uh, guess what? Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, coal country, he's a big fan of nuclear power because he thinks you can put nuclear power plants where the coal plants used to be and that a lot of the workers can get the same job. So let's think about the future, everybody. I mean, if you want to live in the past, sure, go cheer at a Trump rally. But uh, we do have to live in the future at some point. Well said, sir. Yahoo Finance senior economist Rick Newman. Always good to see you. Appreciate it. See you guys. All right, well, much more uh, market analysis and news uh, live from the NASDAQ market site here in Times Square. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Goldman Sachs analysts and top executives from across the technology, media, and telecoms landscape are gathered in San Francisco for its annual Communicopia and Technology Conference. Next door is doing some pretty cool things on the AI front with our assistant and also with Vitality. For us, it actually starts to unleash unique data. We are the local knowledge graph, so I think the value of what we do starts to really shine forth. We're the only platform where you're finding out what's going on around you locally in real time. So with that data, we can do things like on the platform, help a neighbor compose a post in a way that is more engaging. So the assistant or the AI actually does that for you. There's lots of interesting discussion we can have around AI. So we announced just this morning, uh, Zoom AI Companion, which is our answer to how generative AI is gonna be included in our platform. And there's all kinds of really cool features that come with that for our paid subscribers. There are things like Chat Compose, if you're in a chat thread and you wanna be able to respond to that. There are things like meeting summaries, which after the fact help categorize and, and capture not only what happened in the meeting, but also the true sentiment. I think any creative would admit that AI is transformative to how they think about and how they concept new ideas. So I think it's gonna be very exciting. It's still early innings and we gotta figure out how to do it right. There's a lot of hype in our industry. I think this may be underhyped. I think it impacts things at so many levels. It impacts how we interact with computers and how they seem personal. It generates how art and media is created. It, it's a really a breakthrough in computer science and it impacts not only the products, but it impacts how software is created. There certainly needs to be a lot of debate about AI and journalism. 57% of newsroom jobs in the United States have been lost. We're facing uh, another wave, in this case a tsunami potentially of job losses uh, because of the impact of AI. And, and these are not ju just jobs lost, but it's 
inside whilst. It's important that all media companies uh, understand the impact, but it also it's incumbent on the big AI players to understand their impact. We launched Intuit Assist. Uh, and Intuit Assist is really a personalized, intelligent uh, assistant in your pocket. Uh, it's also uh, powered by AI-driven human experts uh, so that when you are getting assistance from Intuit Assist, if you ever need to talk to an expert, no matter what it is that you're doing, you're able to do that. So there's always a gateway uh, to help. AI is going to change this whole industry completely. And so we're thinking a lot about how do we use AI to match people a lot better um, and to support the conversations that are happening. I think conversational AI is also a big opportunity because people do produce all these messages. So helping them craft those messages, make it easier to communicate, I think is, is something people will really appreciate as well. Welcome back. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Brian Sazi at the NASDAQ market site in New York City. We're about uh, 32 minutes into the start of trading here on the day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. Stocks this morning are lower on the second to last trading day of the third quarter. Initial jobless claims and GDP revisions impacting the market. Those unemployment numbers came in lower than expected at just 204,000 for last week. And second quarter GDP held a solid 2.1% annual growth in revisions but consumer spending appeared weaker than previously reported. All right, looking at individual names, shares of Exxon are in focus today after closing at a record high on Wednesday. That was the fourth straight session of gains for the energy giant, boosting or boosted by rising oil prices as low U.S. crude inventory fuel concerns about supply concerns, also boosting oil prices, production cuts from Saudi Arabia, and fuel export bans from Russia. And another stock that we're watching this morning is PayPal, trending today on Yahoo Finance on news that it is partnering with Crypto.com. The Singapore-backed cryptocurrency exchange will become a preferred platform for the stablecoin PayPal USD. Crypto.com has already listed the PYUSD coin on its platform for both retail and institutional investors. This move further expands the relationship between the fintech giant and the crypto exchange. 
and BlackBerry, remember that, uh, is on the move today ahead of its second quarter earnings results out after the bell today. The company is expected to report losses of about six cents per share on $137 million in revenue. BlackBerry has obviously lost significant market share uh, as it no longer sells phones, but its cloud vehicle data platform, Ivy, is in fact gaining traction. They just announced a partnership with Mitsubishi Electric to power its new in-vehicle system. All right, now let's get you the market commentary of the day. And Brad, uh, J.P. Morgan analyst Doug Anmuth is lowering Netflix's estimates to reflect recent comments from management around margin expansion and growth trajectory. He believes the streaming giant stock remains positive overall, but has concerns that paid sharing is being uh, is less impactful than expected. Uh, and really interesting note here from the folks at J.P. Morgan, Brad. But I really, you really have to start with the fact that Netflix shares down about 14% over yeah. the past two weeks. S&P 500 down about, let's say, 4.5%. There's concern going into this Netflix quarter. That all the hype around all the changes, the password crackdowning, the, pay, the move to uh, put ads on the platform, it may just be a big fat dud in terms of uh, profits, whether that is uh, operating profits or net profits. Yeah, some of the key takeaways from this. As a result, their 2024 and 2025 estimates, they come down for revenue by about 2 to 3%, for operating income by about 5 to 6%. And um, as you're continuing to really evaluate what they're looking towards, and, and some of this had come forward during their trending report earlier this month, but particularly remaining overweight here, but lowering the December 2024 price target to $455 based on about 24 and a half times uh, the free cash flow for the end of 2025 of $8.1 billion. So all of this considered, I think as you're looking across the continued impact because of the crackdown on paid sharing through Q3, mobile usage and certain other sharing instances suggesting the company can continue to tighten up paid sharing going forward is what they're writing here. But advertising remains the crawl phase here. I like that. That's pretty good. Crawl? Crawl phase. And you, but you go down to this bottom of this report, Brad, and is certainly there's concern about the near-term outlook for a company Netflix. But under the investment thesis section, we believe Netflix is a key beneficiary and driver of the ongoing disruption of linear TV. And I think that is a, an important longer term consideration, not only Netflix, uh, but of course, the names of like Roku, because look what we're seeing out of Disney, Brad. Here is a, a Disney uh, under Bob Iger, still trying to, the flailing around, trying to figure out what to do with their TV assets. And he pulled the trigger on that ABC. He worked at ABC. He, he mm -hmm. understands ABC, that is Bob Iger. So to see Bob Iger out there reportedly shopping those ABC assets, it, wow, it just tells you that the push to streaming remains not only alive and well, it continues to accelerate and drive a lot of disruption. Well, you know, one company or one platform that would certainly want for there to not be, at least, you know, as we think about where Netflix has lagged in some of the live element or sports element, they've certainly leaned into some of the non-scripted television most recently. I mean, Love is Blind is back for, what, a fifth yeah. season? I never saw that. We just, we just saw the ads behind us in Times Square mm -hmm. yesterday. And I didn't know that we were at season five of Love is Blind already. So I'm excited. But uh, it's the trash yeah. TV that they've been able to bring on and get people like Brian Sazi to uh, stay on, on the platform. He's going to call me out. I won't, I won't tell them which show you watch. You can tell them that for yourself. Please don't. I will just add this very quickly. I understand the near-term concern on Netflix, but yeah. that bidding between Comcast and Disney, and the FT really broke it down earlier in the week, that has begun for that Hulu asset. Uh, some of the valuations being talked about potentially for Hulu are pretty mind-blowing. It's unclear ultimately how much Disney will pay for that asset, but something like that, if a big number does come through and Disney puts out a lot of money for Hulu, that could actually boost Netflix's stock. Yeah, that amount of bidding is too hot to handle for sure. <laughs> well, the S&P 500 has spiraled in recent days with the benchmark index shedding about 3% since the Federal Reserve warned of its higher for longer stance, but the sell-off isn't necessarily a buying opportunity according to some on Wall Street. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer is here with that story. Hey, Josh, what are the bears saying out there? Yeah, Brad, so we've been taking a pulse of the uh, the Bears and the Bulls here, right, and seeing who's, who's maybe finding a buying opportunity in this dip that we've seen and who is not. So J.P. Morgan's Marco Kalanovic has had a 4,200 target call on the S&P 500 for some time now. He's not moving off that call, and in, if anything, probably sees a move to the downside over a move to the upside. That's largely for some obvious reasons we've seen when you take a look at that 10-year that's up about 50 basis points over the last month, and then you look at oil coming up nearly 15 percent over the last month as well we know those are key obvious headwinds but then he also highlights an interesting thing here overall he says that the core risk for markets in the economy remains interest rate shocks and kalinovic sort of gets into 
a comparison to 2008, how interest rate shocks worked then in 2008 and 2000, 2007 and 2008, and says, of course, this time is different. We're not necessarily talking about subprime mortgages, but he said that it rhymes with 2008, and he takes a look at consumer delinquencies that we're seeing on certain loans. So if we take a look at that chart from JP Morgan, you can see consumer or delinquencies on consumer loans picking up significantly. You're seeing there, there are loan or delinquencies for credit cards, delinquencies for auto loans, look at bankruptcies, up significantly, all rising as that Fed funds rate comes up. And so when we're talking about that lagging impact that Kalanovic sees, you had a lot of companies that borrowed at pretty cheap prices, pretty cheap loans, right? Not a lot of interest on those loans. Of course, as they come back to market over the last year, in the next year, they're gonna have to pay a lot more to borrow money as they pay more to borrow money. We're gonna see more people defaulting, whether that be consumers or corporates. So they're sticking with the stance here that they're, we're still gonna see a slowdown and this is not necessarily gonna be, you know, a short bounce and then, sorry, a short drop and then a bounce back up, at least not for now. Josh, you're plugged in, Josh, you're plugged into markets. Of course, Manning, that uh, one of my favorite things on Yahoo Finance, that is uh, our live markets blog. As you talk to people in markets and you consume a lot of these notes, is Marco's view on markets, is that the outlier or is that just the vibe on Wall Street as you look towards the rest of October? Yes, yeah, Saz, it seems like it, it can really go both ways, right? Which I know is sort of me taking the middle ground and you can always say that, but I just spoke with Liz Young, the head of strategy over at SoFi about an hour ago, and she's sort of in Marco's camp. She said, you know, the sell-off over the last week was warranted, but I'd like to see more. I think these valuations are still too high. The S&P 500, the overall PE there is just simply too high and needs to fall below 18 likely, which would be a leg down for the S&P. But then you talk to some other folks and they see potential for this to just continue for the S&P to pick back up. If you look at, say, Tom Lee at Fundstrat, who's normally known as a, one of the more bullish strategists on Wall Street. Right now, Fundstrat th sees things going higher because of why the Fed is threatening to keep interest rates high, right? When we think about interest rates being high and sort of what Jerome Powell said last week, the bull take is, well, if interest rates are high because the economy is going to keep doing well, Overall, that should be good for earnings. GDP growth would, in theory, be good for earnings. So you can see both sides here sort of playing out. Over the next month, there aren't too many people that look at an auto strike, a looming government shutdown, and the potential for another interest rate hike in November, Saz, as a positive for equities, at least in the next month. But luckily, we'll have some more time to see how it plays out. Josh Schaefer, Josh Schaefer good stuff uh, as always. Appreciate it. All right, the government is at risk of shutting down if lawmakers fail to reach a spending deal before the deadline on September 30th. And if a shutdown happens, the lives of Americans who use any federal health programs could be at risk. Is the health care industry at risk? Joining us now, Howard Dean, former governor of Vermont and former DNC chair, and Dr. Nahid Badelia, Boston University Center for Emerging Infectious Disease Policy and Research Founding Director and former senior policy advisor for global COVID-19 response for the White House. Good morning uh, to you both. Uh, Howard, let me start with you here. Just your take on, on the, the really the rolling impact of our government shutdown. What should this country be in store for? Well, I think uh, the inconvenience and the problem is not going to be health care in the short term. We have institutions. It's mostly in the private sector, although the uh, the government plays a huge hand. I think the, the real danger immediately is going to be things like airlines shutting down because air traffic controllers aren't going to work for no pay for, uh, you know, after a while. Uh, it, what's going to happen to the TSA? So travel, airline crippled, airlines crippled, uh, and then it's going to go downhill from there. But I do think the healthcare system is not in immediate danger. Do you believe, uh, Dr. Bedelia, that we could see some type of continuing resolution that would at least curb some of the concerns here? I think that's the major point, right? If they're not able to find a continuing resolution and depending on what's in the continuing resolution, if they do pass it, I think that's the real decider. In my mind, you know, healthcare and public health are sort of linked and immediately you could see if a continuing resolution is not passed, certain programs uh, such as SNAP or WIC, uh, they could use carryover funds, but if the shutdown continues, you're seeing potentially most vulnerable people at risk. And even though, I mean, I, I think, you know that majority of the exceptions and exemptions will ensure that staff at HHS who are taking care of direct life or services that protect human life will be in staff. What do you do percent of HHS staff are going to be furloughed? That means, you know, I, Governor Dean knows this, and I've worked in federal government. 
the bench is not very deep when it comes to the number of people who are working on this. The services will be impacted, particularly if it is a prolonged, uh, prolonged shutdown. Doctor, how should people watching this, if they do fall into that most vulnerable camp, how, th how should they be preparing for it today? Yeah, I think one of the, the bigger programs that concerns me that might be at risk, the appropriations for the Community Health Center Fund, which provides 70% of the funding for federally qualifying health centers is, is due September 30th. And um, if they're not able to be on the continuing resolution, uh, and if they're not refunded, what's at risk is potentially hiring new physicians and 31.5 million patients will be that they will be serving, right? That's one of the big direct uh, risk programs that I think is at risk. Most of this depends on how much carryover funds these um, programs have. And in some cases with WIC and SNAP, a lot of that has to do with how much states uh, will be able to pitch in. Um, I One hopes one hopes that the, the people who are actually receiving the services will not see a change. However, they are saying, at least for WIC, between California, Texas, and Florida, uh, almost 2 million people may be at risk for losing their benefit if there is not a continuing resolution. Uh, former Governor Dean, you, you have a career in public service and as an elected official. Are the elected officials right now that are in Congress correctly serving their constituents, knowing that this shutdown can impact so many people and have a broader economic hit, too, if it extends for a longer period of time? Uh, look, the problem here is, is one person who's incompetent, which is the speaker. Uh, if this were Nancy Pelosi, she would put together a deal. And the only deal that's going to get made, given the far right hold on the Republican caucus, is a deal between Democratic members and Republican members. And that would have to be blessed by the speaker. The speaker won't do it because it'll cost him his speakership. Uh, so it's a mess. It's what happens when you have people in government who shouldn't be there. Uh, but that's where we are. There will be a shutdown. And I think it's going to last uh, at least a couple of weeks. Uh, Governor, let me just stay with you here. Someone that, you know, uh, has dealt with big budgets before and, and big numbers, you know, how would a shutdown impact how the U.S. economy is viewed? How damaging could this be? It could be very damaging if it goes on for, uh, for a while. Um, I, you know, I, I think, you know, we are the, the currency of the world, as it were, uh, and that probably won't change yet, but if we keep doing this, it will. Uh, there's a big difference between the last shutdown and this shutdown in, in the terms of other uh, currencies uh, becoming more and more uh, worldwide ex uh, accepted on a worldwide basis. It's probably not the yuan yet, uh, but certainly uh, the euro. And so I, this is going to be very damaging in the long term. Um, and it's just a, a product of our division. It's a product of people being felt left behind. It's a problem of one party playing on grievance politics. And, you know, I, I, I basically think the platform of of the Republican Party is hate and anger, and it's a pretty successful plat platform right now. Doctor, you know, when you think about the furloughs that would take place, the impact on FDA, EPA activities on food and water safety, what type of suspension of those operations would, would consumers also be rights to perhaps curtail some of their activity or perhaps just be more cognizant of, of where they are spending, where they are consuming, and, and making sure that, you know, not to kind of be fear-mongering here, but still recognizing what the real absence of some of those hazard investigations boards would mean. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because, again, I think, you know, it's not a joke to shut down the government. You know, it is, it, the political posturing has real impact on real people. And both FDA and EPA have said that uh, having to furlough their staff, right? The FDA is going to furlough one fifth of their staff by Sunday. Uh, the EPA has said that they won't be able to take on and review new, um, new investigations for permits under the Clean Water Act or Clean Air Act. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the Chemical Safety and Hazard board will suspend open investigations. All of this has an impact on our health. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention that's up at September 30th that is also contentious and potentially has an impact on public health is, as you know, I work on 
specifically pandemic preparedness and the pandemic, uh, the pandemic preparedness and all hazards authorization act, the PAPA reauthorization act is also up on September 30th. And the things that would be affected if parts of it are allowed to expire are hospital preparedness. And here we are at the end of a really long public health emergency. The question is, have we not learned a lesson to continue to try to invest in these things and to ensure that it's continuity um, so that we're prepared for any new threats that come along? All right, really appreciate the perspective and insights from you both. Howard Dean, former governor of Vermont, and Dr. Nahid Badelia, who is the founding director at Boston University Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. All your markets action straight ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We're here at the NASDAQ in New York City's Times Square. Let's do a check of the markets sponsored by Tasty Trade. Right now we're seeing markets, well, they're in the green for a change. All morning long we've been talking about markets increasingly under pressure, at least for right now. We're seeing some green on the screen. All three major averages, averages uh, have gained steam and are slightly, I would say slightly, in the green. Of course, I'm scrolling over to the yahoofinance.com platform and looking up our trending ticker page, a couple names that are popping out to me, GameStop, Shares really have given back a lot of their gains from earlier in the session on news um, that CEO, uh, that Ryan Cohen, controlling shareholder in that company, now is in fact uh, going to be CEO, not collecting any pay. Surprise, surprise. Uh, another name I'm watching, CarMax. Stock is getting absolutely slaughtered. Uh, really, the company came out with earnings this morning, warned about the lag and impacts uh, of higher interest rates. And then, ah, Brad, I'm looking for one more Peloton. A lot of excitement on that deal with uh, Lululemon. Uh, that was reported uh, yesterday afternoon, really giving back a lot of those gains. I think a lot of po folks on the street are realizing, uh, Brad, that by and large, Peloton remains a very challenged company, despite that Lululemon clothing deal. Yeah, uh, pedaling backwards there, uh, at <laughs> least for some of the gains that we had seen from some of the gains we had seen earlier in today's session. Well, with only two trading sessions left in the third quarter, today, tomorrow, it's been a difficult month for stocks, with investors now looking ahead to October in the fourth quarter, also known as Jinx Month, October is. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery joins us now for a look at what to expect. Jared, they're not going to like 
that there's a 13th, a Friday the 13th that's in October as well. My goodness, I'll that tell you what, it, it's right before my birthday, so I'm going to have that day off. I'm not worried at all. Um, but right now, S&P 500 pedaling in the right direction today, but I don't think uh, the short-term weakness is quite over. Having said that, let me just show you what we might expect for October. This is what happens historically, going back to 1960. I have the last four months of the year, and this purple line down here, that is September. If you invested $1,000 in 1960, only in the month of September, it would be worth um, just a little bit more than half of that right now. Now, we have October, guess what? That's the next one up here. That's that cyan line. But you'll notice there are some big uh, swings in here. October known for a month of volatility. And I'm going to take a look at the VIX in a second. But after that, we have December and then November. So by the time we get to November, it tends to be more or less smooth sailing, especially in December. But we remember from 2018, we had that bad, mark that bad bear market emerge uh, in the month of December. Um, that's taking a look at what the S&P 500 tends to do on a month by month basis. This is what the VIX does, and I have a little bit more granularity here. Uh, I showed this briefly in the last hour. We have the potential, the potential for historical tendencies to bring the VIX higher into October 12th. So that's about the middle of the second week of October. And then I want to show one more thing before I bring it around. This is a CNN fear, fear and Greed Index. We just ticked down to the fear, extreme fear level 24. Now we can bounce around in here for a while, but typically this is a mean reversion signal. This is a contrary signal such that we, are, we have sentiment so low that the market is able to rocket off of these lows. Now, let me bring you to a current chart of the S&P 500. Um, we are nearing the 4,200 level. We were just talking with Josh Schaefer about Marco Kalanovich's 4,200 call. That would bring it right to about here. Tons of options activity at that 4,200 strike. So I think we do hit it. And we could see a bounce, perhaps, off of that. I'd also add that the NASDAQ is right at a level right here where it could theoretically bounce. Uh, but I don't really see the markets being cleared until probably that first middle of the second week of October are cleared. After that, hopefully smooth sailing into the end of the year. But these are just tendencies. Seasonality, which has been working very well this year, uh, accounts for maybe a third of returns. But that's it. Like I'd say life can definitely intervene, guys. Brad, you want to sing an early happy birthday? Uh, Jared turns 25, or we just wait a couple weeks. Would you? It's up to you, Jared. I, I'm, I'm down for a singing fest uh, festivities here. Do you want the old school or do you want the Stevie Wonder? Oh, Stevie Wonder. Okay, we'll sing it in the break. Oh, I thought you were going to oh, do it. Right. We're going to do it right here. All right, yeah. Jared, we'll be right, right back with you. I feel gypped. All right, my, Micron's quarter. Micron. That's Micron. Micron's quarter. Look decent on the surface, but some on the street are squawking over a tepid margin. Now, look, Stephen Fox covers... Micron and is the CEO of Fox Advisor. Steve, uh, always great to get some time with you. Uh, so Micron really seems to be a perennial laggard. Was there any signs of life in this company that demand is going to come back and, and pricing is starting to come back and the earnings power of Micron is going to be uh, strong once again in the back half of the year? So there was definitely good news in the quarter. I mean, we've been cutting numbers for the better part of a year. We've been below the street, and we finally got to the point where we're not cutting numbers anymore. Um, however, the bad news is I think the sell side in general and consensus is thinking too optimistically about the type of rebound Micron is going to have from these levels. It's it. First of all, you're coming off of a really bad low. The company lost uh, you know, $4.8 billion last year, including over a billion dollars in the quarter last completed. They're still losing money this quarter at, at that rate. And they're benefiting from having written down inventories to zero costs and then selling them through, um, you know, to customers. And that's hundreds of millions of dollars of benefit. So this is a really extreme bottom. And I think you're from this bottom, you're going into end markets that are still questionable. So, you know, the type of rebound that people have been expecting is getting a bit of a re reality check today. If Micron misses out on the artificial intelligence moment that many other chip companies have been able to capitalize on, what does that spell out for Micron's future? Yeah, I don't think they're missing out per se, but it's still a very small percentage of sales. I mean, there's a long runway with AI to come. But for now, you know, this is, we're talking about their high bandwidth memory um, products that are gonna sell extremely well next year, but it's still only seven, several hundred million dollars of business against a base of business that's $15 billion. So this is not a big driver yet, but if you wanted to look out three to five years, yes, they will benefit, but it's not something that's gonna get you instant gratification over the next several quarters. 
Stephen, I, I can appreciate a good inflection point, but if one wants to play the AI trade, I, who cares about Micron? Why not just back up the truck on an NVIDIA pullback and dump your life savings in there? Yeah, so I don't know about life savings. I would never dump my life savings into one stock. I think what you want to do, and NVIDIA is an expensive stock, which I don't follow personally, is look for cheap ways to play uh, AI. And Micron has a lot of end market risk still to play out. I would look at companies that are benefiting from being extremely good manufacturers tied well into um, companies like Amazon and Microsoft. Companies like that's come to mind to me are Jabil and Flex, which are contract manufacturers that have a lot of inherent skills and are serving those markets increasingly fast. I just got off a Jabil call. That's a value stock that has produced 25% annual earnings growth over the last six years in a tough macro is looking for at least 10% earnings growth this year and next year, while buying back you know, 10 to 20% of their stock the next couple of years and growing really fast with a range of uh, cloud applications. So I would look for value plays on AI at this point in order to avoid sort of the hype movement that seems to be impacting Micron stock today. You're, you're equal weight on Micron right now, so you're just chilling. What would cause you to be kind of hot and sexy about Micron and MU shares? Yeah, so never, no one's ever accused me of just chilling or hot and sexy, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> in, in terms of our opinion on Micron, what we're th seeing now is a bottoming. The problem is that this bottoming, I don't think results in like a return to prior cyclical tops anytime soon because earnings are so depressed and there's some accounting benefits going on. So like if you go out eight quarters, we think maybe you get back to like $5 of annualized earnings, but with where the stock is at, you know, that's 14, 15 times earnings for a highly cyclical business. Um, that's also you know, dependent now on government subsidies. Whereas, like I just mentioned, you could buy Jabil or Flex at 10 or 11 times earnings and get you know, a more steady, steady growth story. Steve, is there one chip stock or one tech stock that people should just avoid at all costs going into next year? You know, that's a tough question because I don't, I don't necessarily think that Ne you know, next year gets worse from here. I just think we're entering a slower recovery than most people would look for. So I wouldn't say that we're necessarily avoiding, you know, broadly avoiding um, our group or would say broadly avoid a specific name, but there is going to be out relative outperformance and which is why I made the comparison to Jabil and Flex, where I think you get some relative outperformance there versus say a Micron that has run up 35% into their earnings call that maybe anticipated a lot of this. So I think it's more about just finding those sort of, um, you know, unearth areas of investment that maybe play out a little bit better than others. So we're, we're very stock specific now. That's why I mentioned a couple other names besides Micron. We don't think Micron has another leg down. We just think it's going to take a little longer to come back because 35% of their sales are still, still tied to handsets and PCs, which is a dicey market we think into next year. Stephen Fox, Fox Advisors founder and CEO. Steve, great to have the conversation with you here on the day. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone, we've got all your markets action straight ahead, live from the NASDAQ market side. Stay tuned. we got much more to discuss here. Yeah, we do.
the highway. Welcome back, everyone. We are live from the NASDAQ in New York City. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. Well, from store closures to store reopenings, the rise of e-commerce and now the integration of AI. It's safe to say that the retail sector has seen a lot of changes since the pandemic. But one thing remains the bedrock of shopping, fashion trends. And denim is back, baby. It's back in fashion. And that's how TD Cowan sees it, too, initiating an outperform rating on Levi Strauss, saying the company is set up for global growth, driven by its icon status and its younger fashion-forward consumers. Let's bring in TD Cowan senior research analyst Oliver Chen to discuss more. Oliver, I've been waiting to see this jean jacket that is just as, as snazzy as they said it would be here. It is that We assumed it was the level one trucker jacket or the type one trucker jacket from Levi's. You can correct us later here. But what is really the driving catalyst behind this call for Levi's? Yeah, we're excited, Brad, about the iconic nature of the brand. As we survey consumers, it's number one by far. It also has dominant share. But as we look forward, what's really happening is global growth. Levi's is going more direct to consumer through premium stores. They're also going more international. This jacket is also an example of what they're doing in stores, which is highly experiential premium stores where you can get things customized in a unique way. So all these pieces put together uh, an attractive growth story, low double digit algorithm in terms of EPS growth combined with the valuation that's reasonable at 10 times versus a 12 times PE average. Th that's the main story here. In addition, we're very positive on other things happening as you are correct with fashion trends such as I'm still a skinny jeans guy, but wide leg is definitely <laughs> in, as well as vintage. Oliver, I've, I've known you for a while. I've been following your work for a while. I tell everybody you're the best dressed retail analyst on the street. I mean, it's not even comparable. Um, so <laughs> Levi is going to report in about a week, couple days, whatever it is. Do you think the stock has de-risked enough if Levi's comes out here and says on the earnings call, we're seeing a wholesale slow down and traffic at our retail stores have also slowed down and, and maybe tweaks that guidance. Yeah, Brian, you bring up a good point. In terms of the near term, we are two pennies below street. And what we are concerned about in the near term is some dislocation in inventory and having too much inventory and the company working through that. That partly relates to some systems changes. Um, we love the story for the long term, but it's something we're watching and valuation does look attractive to us in terms of the stock pulling back the past couple of quarters where these have been issues to monitor. So that's something we're watching uh, into next week, which is Thursday, this near-term cautious factor as well. Yeah, a lot of data that I've been uh, consuming, Oliver, notably around credit card delinquencies, those things seem to be picking up. And the consumer over the past four weeks seem to have, they've slowed down a little bit. I, how, how severe uh, I guess are just overstocked or retailers right now in terms of inventory. Is there another glut taking form based on your research? Yeah, what we are seeing is cracks in the consumer. So we're seeing uh, inflation be a big deal and also energy and consumers going out again and spending more on travel over things. Uh, that's something we're watching closely. We're also seeing too much inventory, particularly with aspirational luxury, meaning more entry price luxury. That's a problem area too. And we're watching China, unemployment, youth unemployment, as well as housing and technology. Those are considerations too. Unfortunately, the, the traffic's been a little bit weaker in September. So those are all headwinds. On the positive side, the labor market is still very tight, meaning unemployment is low at 3.8% and $700 billion of savings on the sideline. So there's positives and negatives. Just to take it back to the stocks we like, we might like market share leaders. That includes Levi's, it includes Walmart, it includes Costco, and also LVMH. We think they're good places to be in this environment, which really has the cross currents that you're describing, Brian. So we're cautiously optimistic, and we do think it will be promotional, and we are watching these delinquencies, which are reverting back to pre-pandemic levels at many department stores. Oliver, when we were talking about your, your, your fashion, your style, I mean, all of us just want to have the office like you have as well here. So there's, there's a lot at play for you and working well in your favor. But when you think about some of the broader trends right now for people who have fashion and good taste like you, the quiet luxury trend certainly has been catching a lot of attention here. What is the top trade idea for investors who are trying to play quiet luxury? 
Yeah, Brad, we're excited about Gucci and Caring Group. Um, it's quiet and it's loud, but it's quiet in terms of what they're doing with classics and return to fabrics and craftsmanship. Uh, that's a trend that's really material. And to me, quiet luxury is about going back to the basics, great fabrics, great feel, uh, great heritage, and reinterpreting those in new ways, and in some ways de-emphasizing logo as well. So our top pick here is Caring Group, which owns Gucci, St. Laurent, uh, Pomoletto, and Bottega Veneta. And what we're watching really at this stock is the new Gucci designer who came out with a recent collection that we're quite excited about. There's another brand, Laura Piano, and that's part of the LVMH group. Uh, that's a very good quiet luxury trend as well. Um, we're seeing quiet luxury, we're seeing investing in your face and beauty, uh, and then this premiumization, the lifestyle evolution of Levi's will be exciting to watch too. It is return to classic, it's return to office, it's balancing uh, these new and old trends, but that's exciting too. Change is always very exciting. We're, we're trying to kind of paint some broad strokes here ahead of Nike earnings and just knowing that you look across the apparel, the footwear, the textiles companies here, when you think about the inventory that these companies are needing to move through and the amount of that that's actually going out the door at full price versus where there is discounting that the consumer is looking for, what should we be keeping an eye on going into this fourth quarter here and the guidance that many of these companies continue to give us about where the consumer is gravitating more towards discounts versus a full price, even if there might be a quiet luxury trend or if there may be kind of a hype beast item or, you know, skew yeah. that everybody is attracted to? Yeah, Brad, thematically, consumers care a lot about value. They're looking for promotions. They're looking for great deals. We have a consumer that's very considered, taking pauses. Um, what retailers really need to do is uh, execute to opening price points and maintain these opening price points because consumers are looking for deals, especially as they have to spend more on housing and energy. Gas prices is something to watch, uh, which will adversely impact traffic. And traffic is a, a big lever for us to watch too. Overall, it's a return to store year. E-commerce has been a little bit tougher, but this focus on value and executing to newness as well as value, off price being a very attractive sector as well. Walmart offering everyday low prices, uh, that will be key. And then again, you still have a lot of, uh, a lot of um, great strategies at luxury goods where you're executing the higher prices. So it's bifurcated in a way, and I think we'll continue to see this bifurcated, bouncy consumer uh, with, with both kinds of trends happening where con brands are really trying to make you pay a lot and execute really, really well. And then other value-focused opportunities like Costco, which is a club membership model, Walmart, an everyday low price model, and the off-pricers and apparel are uh, very, very strong and safe places to be as well. T.D. Cowan, Senior Research Analyst Oliver Chen, wearing what he researches is. I love it. Oliver, have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Great seeing you both. All right, do stick around. Much more uh, analysis and market news straight ahead on Yahoo Finance Live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. We'll be right back.
Now, last night's second GOP primary debate, presidential hopefuls weighed in on the UAW strike with some calling out Joe Biden's push for electric vehicle adoption. Former VP Mike Pence called Biden's agenda good for Beijing, bad for Detroit, while North, Car North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum hinted at job losses from the EV transition, saying the strike is at Joe Biden's feet. Meanwhile, former President Trump, in a visit to Michigan Auto Factory, warned workers the electric vehicle shift would kill their jobs in just a few years. But our next guest says the transition to electric is bound to come, and any automaker with a prayer of surviving the next decade has no choice but to boost EV production. With us now to discuss more is David Underkoffler, Autolist Editor-in-Chief. David, great to get you here on really what it continues to be an increasingly challenging situation for the automakers. So I'll put this to you. Uh, is a large part why the workers are on strike. Is it because of that EV transmission, transition in large part pushed through by the Biden administration? Short answer is no, nah, not at all. What the, the, striker, the workers are striking for are increased wages. They're looking for more pension support. Uh, they're arguing for a shorter work week. Uh, so very little of that has to do immediately with the transition to EV. Now, in the background of all that, there is some anxiety. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, on the part of UAW workers about the transition to EVs. Uh, that's not gonna be necessarily addressed in this contract, but look, EVs are much simpler machines than gas powered vehicles. It's much easier to produce those and to assemble them. They take fewer people to do so. So at some point, certainly this is going to be uh, something they're going to need to address. It is on their minds, but right now, uh, no, this is more about wages and, and that sort of growth. David, do you see any line of sight into this ending. You know, Ford appears to have been given a little bit of pass here near term, but again, they're all these strikes are continuing. Or do you see Friday that next really uh, the UA strikes at more facilities and this gets worse? Well, I was on last week talking with Rochelle, and like I said, uh, I, you know, I'm not a labor expert. I, I barely know what I'm having for lunch today. So far be it for me to predict where this is going. I will say this though. Uh, I doubt that they're going to come to a resolution this week. It, just, it doesn't seem like they're getting offers that are near uh, what they're expecting at this point. Certainly, there's been some uh, some, some better uh, sort of uh, energy around Ford. Uh, it does seem like they're getting closer there, but it still doesn't seem like they're going to get something uh, by tomorrow. I would imagine that if they do get to tomorrow and nothing has no deals have been struck, uh, they may the UAW may leave sort of Ford on the wayside. They did that last week with some distribution centers. They struck. Uh, distribution centers for GM and Stellantis and left Ford out of it. I would imagine you might see that again tomorrow, but right now there are no signs that there are uh, there's a resolution in the near term. Uh, David, you had mentioned a moment ago the ease of production for some of the electric vehicles versus the combustion engine vehicles. When you think about how that plays into not just the negotiations, but the margin profiles for companies, if these are easier to produce and they cut out perhaps the time to produce or even the number of parts that are necessary, how does that change the margin profile for some of the major automotive manufacturers? Yeah, that's a great question. It certainly uh, presents the opportunity for, for fatter margins. I think all automakers look very enviously at the margins that Tesla has right now. Uh, but before the, the big automakers, not just the big three, but sort of the, the global players right now, get to that point where these <clears throat> they have these really juicy margins, it's going to be years of lots of R&D, uh, lots of battery technology, lots of uh, retooling existing plants or building new plants, whether that's to assemble these vehicles or to, to build the batteries themselves. So um, at some point in the future, yes, that's certainly something that I think everyone has their mind on. Uh, but right now and in the next five, 10 years, there are just significant R&D and investment hurdles to the tune of billions and billions of dollars for every automaker uh, before they can get to that point. We've been talking all morning long, David, about really a bad quarter today out of CarMax. Sales down double digits, company warning that things may not get any better anytime soon, in large part because of really those higher interest rates pushed forward by the Federal Reserve. What is the state of the used car market in this country? And do you see uh, prices really on the precipice of plunging. Yeah, used cars, man, they, they really took a, a hit uh, in terms of the pricing during the pandemic. They, they went up to historic highs. New car prices are certainly at historic highs. Um, there were, were Earlier this year, there were some signs that those were easing. Um, and so that's certainly encouraging, especially for consumers. Uh, lower income consumers are definitely the ones who have been feeling the squeeze throughout this entire sort of price trajectory. There are just fewer affordable cars on the market. Um, interest rates are not helping that. Uh, you know, it's making cheaper cars more expensive for everyone to buy. But 
Uh, we are still seeing some signs that the used car market is improving. Uh, inventory levels are improving. Uh, and on the same side, inventory levels on the new car side are also improving. That takes some of the pressure off the used side. So, yeah, I mean, I know, uh, you know, Carfax or excuse me, CarMax is certainly seeing some pressure there. Uh, I think lots of players in that space are. Uh, but there are still, we're still seeing positive signs uh, in terms of new cars, used cars prices falling uh, for this calendar year. In, in this pricing environment, should we continue to see that play into next year or whenever the Cybertruck is finally available for purchase and, and delivery? How does that impact what Tesla could even expect, given the, the financing options that would be available, given the price tag um, and all of the other considerations that consumers would really have to wade through for a vehicle that still has yet to have a version of it on the streets right now? Yeah, the Cybertruck is a tough one to read. I know initially when they presented it, they were targeting like a pretty low starting price for a base model, I think a single motor, uh, I think it was rear wheel drive. Um, I would be very surprised if the actual Cybertruck hit the road in the next year to 18 months and it had a starting price of anything lower than $60,000. I mean, that's an expensive proposition out of the gate. Uh, usually all automakers, not just Tesla, like to get the the most premium version at first, those have the, the fattest profit margins. Uh, they're sort of the most appealing. You get them in the hands of journalists. Uh, it's sort of a win-win. And then you sort of trickle down and get to the more affordable ones. So it's going to be a while, even after the Cybertruck does hit the road, it's going to be a while before the more affordable version uh, is in consumer hands. And again, I, that's a relatively low volume play relative to Tesla. I mean, Tesla's the leader right now for Model 3 and Model Y. Um, so I don't see that as having this sort of outsized impact. I think the bigger uh, news for Tesla is they do have, they've already shown a revised Model 3. There's a, a revised Model Y expected, um, potentially brings the price down with different battery technology. Uh, it's a facelift. It looks different. We haven't really seen these two vehicles get updated really since they were introduced. So I think that actually has more potential to generate interest and sort of boost sales again for Tesla. I mean, a mass market Cybertruck. I mean, are we going? Are we talking about going from the shape of a Pentagon down to like a, a rhombus or something like that? I have to make it a circle. A circle, <laughs> or just a just a circle, a sphere <laughs> coming down the road with some other wheels. I can't even imagine. That. Right. Oh, we can't either. And we can't wait to see it. <laughs> David Undercoffler, exactly. Auto List editor in chief. Thanks for taking the time here with us today. Thank you, guys. Definitely. All your markets action straight ahead live from the Nasdaq market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back, everyone. AI is everywhere, including our sorting packages here. UPS announcing today that they're improving their systems with artificial intelligence. They're using pick and place technology to help employees sort small packages. Pick robots, pickle robots to make unload. Is that their name? Pickle robots here? I'm sorry. This is going to help make trailers easier and autonomous guided vehicles. The innovations are being used in select UPS facilities across the U.S. I'm just asking that because uh, uh, that's actually correct. U UPS is using pickle robots. Hey, that robot could grab me a pickle. I mean, I'm all for it. Uh, okay, no, it's an unloading technology here. It's, right. uh, it's pickle robot is the name of it. So uh, easing the job of unloading trailers, making the role less physically demanding for employees delivering better package care and reliability for UPS uh, customers. H here's the backdrop, though. They just netted out a deal with the union to be able to make sure that they could get them back into, yeah. into work here. So what this could, at my read through at least, is this could change the headcount base that they need in order to do some of those jobs and at UPS. And of course, UP, uh, UPS will, will say, well, no, that's not the case. They're, they're, they enhance the experience of work. Or the but, productivity. But you, are, you are witnessing, I think, uh, the robotization of industrial America. You know, I've been really looking at a, a company like Boston Dynamics sure. um, and understanding how they think about robots and what some of these robots do right now. I believe their main robot is called Spot Bread. These things are absolutely mind-blowing. There's more here than, behind, than necessarily a, a YouTube video and them walking around doing cool things. They are moving packages. They're interacting with employees now. They almost seem very human-like. And you know what? Maybe there is something to what Elon Musk has been trying to do with Tesla and these humanoid robots. Mm -hmm. I think he holds a vision, uh, whether it is 10, 20, 50 years from now, where every worker making a Tesla vehicle is in fact a robot. Well, here's one more number for our viewers here so they don't think that this is something brand new. This year, 57% of the packages processed through the UPS network went through automated facilities that are powered by sorting, processing, and data capture technologies. Also, that spot dog that you're talking about, it looks like something out of Black Mirror. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I can't have it. Yeah. But it serves a vital function. It's just absolutely amazing sure. technology. Also amazing, it's been amazing seeing you here, Brad. It's been great. Yeah, it's, it's been, been great. I think you guys are just doing an awesome job here at the NASDAQ. Sure. All right, uh, we'll do a quick check in the markets here. Uh, markets, 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 markets. Well, they're doing markets things. They're in the green. Start off a little red in the pre-market. Bad session overseas in Asia. A little bit of a accelerating gains here. All three major averages are slightly, well, in the green. And that is it for uh, Brad Smith and, well, me, Brian Sazi, Kiko Fujita, and Rochelle Akufo have you for the next hour of trading. Do stick around. I thought you were going to say it's getting more steamy in the markets. Hot and steamy. Always hot and steamy.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufa with Akiko Fujita. Here's a look at what we're watching this morning. Oil surged to its highest price in over a year and is on track for its fourth consecutive monthly gains as supply concerns rise. So we'll paint it the pump persists for consumers. And Tesla's first U.S. autopilot trial kicks off in California today. What this indicates about the future of autonomous driving. Plus, Shopify is betting big on wholesale platform fare. What well, this partnership signals for retail, it's coming up later this hour. Let's take a look, though, at how stocks are moving. Two hours into the trading day right now, we've got the Dow up 74 points, the S&P 500 up 13, and the NASDAQ up 28 points. Uh, this coming despite jobless claims earlier this morning coming in less than expected, indicating the relative resilience we have continued to see in the job market. Treasury yields, of course, certainly in focus as we have seen equities move in tandem on that front. We saw the 10-year Treasury hit a fresh 15-year high today, right now at 4.65%. We are, though, starting this hour with oil. As Rochelle said, we saw oil surging uh, to their highest level in more than a year. Energy stocks popping on the back of that. They jumped more than 34% since the end of June. Um, Rochelle, you know, there's a number of threads here, I, I think, to work through. Uh, number one, when you look at where the energy sector has performed on the back of oil, certainly gaining in a big way. It is the best performing sector this month. At the same time, there is a question here, number one, about what's driving those prices higher, about, but also about at what level demand destruction is likely to begin. Uh, we've heard from Andy Lipow, for example, a, a regular on the show, saying that he believes that it could be anywhere from $100 to $110 a barrel because that would push gas prices above $4 a gallon. Some would argue, though, that destruction already starting to take shape as we uh, sort of stay above that $90 a barrel level. It's true. I mean, and we've been see, seeing this creeping up for the past few months, Brent and WTI, up around 30 percent over the past three months. And when you look at some of the biggest energy companies, apart from Shell, which is in single digit growth over the past three months, ExxonMobil, Chevron, Conoco, Total, BP, they've all seen double digit stock price growth over the last three months. And you raise an interesting point about what is going to be that tipping point. You mentioned that we're starting to see some of this demand destruction that's really been triggered by what we've seen as, as WTI and Brent have been really teetering around that hundred dollar a barrel level. And it's interesting to see these oil prices rising when we don't see, when it's not really signaling that there is a set recession ahead. But then when you look at things like the 10-year yield that's been clearly flashing recession ahead, it does make you wonder, as you said, what is sustaining these oil prices at the moment? Yeah, and we've heard already the likes of Citi as well as Goldman calling, calling for $100 a barrel. The question is, of course, if you're the Fed, you know, how inflationary is this going to be and how sustained those levels are? The backdrop to all of this is, of course, these uh, production cuts that the Saudis recently extended. You've also got the production cuts from uh, Russia. But worth noting what exactly is playing out for the Saudis, you know, you could argue that on the one hand, they, they want this to continue to be a big revenue driver. At the same time, they have been pivoting, um, trying at least, to, to find other investments beyond oil. Now, the Wall Street Journal has a good story out today talking specifically about the Saudis making a bet on where the market is willing or what the market is willing to pay on oil in part to continue to drive revenue on oil as they try to pivot away. Uh, they specifically talk about um, where that level is likely to be. The IMF has said the break-even oil price for the Saudis is about $81 a barrel. We are well above that already right now. It's true. And when you look at some of the expansions that they're making beyond oil, a uh, $500 million stake in Mid-Ocean Energy, which is an LNG company. So really trying to expand the horizons here while still trying to maintain this bet on oil. And you have a lot of consumers wondering when they're going to perhaps see some relief at the pump. Uh, Patrick Dehan, also known as Gas Buddy Guy, saying that gas prices in L.A. where you are are less than a quarter of a way from hitting their record of $6.46. And as we're continuing to see the, the national average um, starting to grow here. A lot of people wondering, wh why aren't they seeing some relief here? So uh, it's important to break down some, some of the information, as you mentioned there, about what's really propping up these oil prices, Akiko. Yeah, Rochelle, you talk about those oil prices or gas prices, I should say, in L.A. Uh, it's a big reason why I switched over to EVs. So uh, I find myself smiling every time I drive by a gas station. But there is certainly a lot of pain <laughs> to be felt uh, among drivers who really can't cut back 
on some of that driving and therefore paying a huge, huge bill there at the gas pump. Well, there are only two trading days left in the third quarter. And while most stocks are stuck in the September slump, energy is a standout performer. So how can investors find success in the market? Joining us now is Francis Newton, Stacey Optimal, Capital of Strategy, Capital Director of Strategy. Uh, Francis, it's good to talk to you today. Uh, let's keep this conversation going on oil. Uh, we have certainly had a number of guests who've come on, you know, saying that they see real opportunity in energy given the pullback that we saw early on in the year. How are you positioned in the space right now? I mean, you know, for those that are overweight energy, they could probably take the money off of the table. Um, I'm not convinced that this is going to sell off significantly. You could be buying some of these pullbacks. You're still paying quite a lot at this point, given the, you know, 30 percent uh, rise in these prices. But the thing is, is that the fundamental story does remain quite strong, because, as you said, the Saudis and the Russians are cutting supply and they are, you know, doing this intentionally to keep prices high. So you've got the supply side part of the story supporting these energy prices. And then the demand hasn't yet wavered, um, you know, because the consumer, even though they're starting to show a lot of stress when it comes to, you know, inflection points and bankruptcies and foreclosures and delinquencies and credit, basically the consumer is still spending money and hanging in there despite the higher rates. And so you have both a strong story from the supply side and the demand side um, on, the, on oil prices continuing higher. They will probably hit that threshold at some point. I don't know where it is particularly, um, but I would wait for a significant pullback if you're going to if you're going to be getting into this meaningfully, um, because you know those prices are already quite elevated in the face of the fact that we're going to continue to have higher for longer rates and tightening, and the mechanics of credit at some play, at some point in time will play out. And Francis, we've seen a, a range of sort of um, outlooks for where oil prices could go anywhere from, you know, around 115, perhaps even higher than. At what point do you think then does demand destruction meaningfully kick in? At what price per barrel would you think? I'm not exactly sure a particular price per barrel. What it is, is that 60 percent of, um, you know, the American populace is living paycheck to paycheck and they are increasingly putting things on credit cards and they're paying more for the things themselves, because inflation, even though it's going up at a slower rate, it's still going up. And they are, you know, every rate hike is creating more and more onerous debt service on that credit card side, right? So what percentage of that populace hits a wall when, when it comes to credit is that, you know, and what is the catalyst for that? Is it student debt payments coming back online or what have you? Um, and then whatever percentage of that populace hits a wall will then determine, you know, when they can literally stop buying things. Um, is it 2% of that populace? Is it 4% of that populace? Is it, you know, catastrophic? Is it 8 or 9% of that populace? Where they just kind of fall off of the consumer bracket. And I'm not sure, you know, what oil price is. The thing about the oil prices remaining high is they participate on a one to two month lag in CPI, headline CPI. And the thing about it is, is that it's going to keep inflation uh, you know, from going down and it's going to keep it high and that's going to keep the Fed very, very tight, which is then going to force this credit issue of when some of these people just absolutely are not offered any more credit and can't put things on credit cards. And that will affect demand eventually, despite the labor market. Uh, Francis, let's talk about how you're positioned in the broader market. We saw a big sell-off yesterday, largely driven by what, where yields have been moving. A fresh 15-year high today with a 10-year at 465. What's the assumption you're operating under right now? I mean, I'm surprised that yields have 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 gone this high. Um, I'm, you know, I'm looking to. We're still pretty defensive. We've done really well with our uranium position. We've done really well with um, our, you know, Japan positioning, given that that's been a bull market. But I think that, you know, at some point. Um, some of the defensive and rate, sec rate sensitive stuff is going to do really well because at some point these rates are going to continue higher until they hit that threshold. And every inch they go higher, the closer they are to that threshold. And you're going to have some meaningful reversals in some of these things, you know, that are rate sensitive. We appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Francis Newton Stacey, Optimal Capital Director of Strategy. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Well, the second GOP primary debate came and went last night with former President Trump once again refusing to take the stage. And this time, the other candidates took the opportunity to go after him a little. Trump's constant critic, Chris Christie, doubled down on his attacks from the last debate, saying, quote, Donald Trump hides behind the walls of his golf clubs and won't show up here to answer questions like all the rest of us are up here to answer. No one up here is going to call you Donald Trump anymore. We're going to call you Donald Duck. Meanwhile, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis also piled on, saying Donald Trump is missing in action. He should be on this stage tonight. Now, the only candidate seemingly in Trump's corner, Vivek Ramaswamy, well, he said, I quote, I will respect Donald Trump and his legacy because it's the right thing to do. Well, joining us now to break down what all the Trump talk means for these candidates is Yahoo Finance senior columnist Rick Newman. Rick, quite a show was put on, although, of course, the main character, Donald Trump, once again, missing in action. Yeah, and it was a bad show, by the way. Um, if, if you decided to go to bed instead of watching this train wreck, uh, you made the right choice. Uh, mostly it was just arguing the moderators did a bad job of keeping the candidates lined up. Um, but you're, you're right. There were uh, a few dings on Donald Trump. Mainly they, uh, as you pointed out, Rochelle, just uh, dinging him for not showing up. But guess what? This strategy seems to be working for Trump uh, because there's been no sign at all that he's slipping in the polls. He's actually gone up a couple of percentage points in the polls against the other Republicans since he skipped the first debate. And and these debates so far, uh, I mean, they're, they're getting worse. Last night was just so bad um, that I think it makes Trump look better by not being associated with it. So um, they are they are trying to figure out what to do about, about the fact that the debate is just a sideshow without Trump uh, involved. But it's just not working. These, de- these debates are basically failing as a way of informing voters about what's really happening on the Republican side. Yeah, Rick, you know, in the meantime, Donald Trump was in Detroit um, talking specifically about the strike that's happening, but he was at a non-union parts <laughs> supplier. Obviously, some jockeying going on between the former president and President Biden for this, I guess we could call it the the blue collar working class vote. Um, How much inroads do you think is Trump actually making? I'm not sure he's making any, to be honest. Um, And it's not just, he's not just going after blue collar votes. He's going after blue collar votes in Michigan, which is a crucial swing state. I mean, Michigan is one of the three or four states that will probably uh, decide the 2024 election. Also Wisconsin nearby, which has also has, uh, you know, some auto factories and some unionized auto workers. Uh, Biden and um, Trump obviously both went to Michigan this week. Biden did stand with picketing workers. He did endorse the uh, United Auto Workers, and he did say the uh, striking workers deserve what they're asking for. Trump did not say that. Um, Trump, you know, he's actually not a fan of unions, which I guess is why he showed up at a non-union factory. And I I'm not really sure what he thinks his constituency is there. So if he's going to Michigan, which is a pretty heavily unionized state, um, and he's trying to win blue collar voters by talking to non-union workers, I don't really see how that works for him. I'm not sure it's a huge negative, but uh, let's keep in mind um, the United Auto Workers did endorse uh, Joe Biden in 2020. I think it's very likely they will endorse Biden again in 2024. And uh, if they could peel off, you know, one or two percent of unionized workers who might have voted for Trump, who don't like the fact that he's showing up in a non-union plan, I think that would be good for Biden. Um, And I I would I would expect, frankly, uh, the Biden campaign to be highlighting Trump talking to a non-union shop up there in Michigan. Yeah, those in Michigan sure to see a lot more of both President Biden and the Mm -hmm. former president in the coming months. Uh, Rick Newman, as always, thanks so much. Bye, guys. Well, we've got all uh, much more of all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. We'll be right back. You have tons of great economic analysis, markets analysis as well, but you're also training for the New York Marathon. <laughs> what is your number one tip for all the runners out there that are perhaps trying to get their miles in and see you when they're running throughout the five boroughs here in New York later? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, you, you have to be really determined to do it, you know, do not give up because as much as it can be very painful and exhausting, you know, when you get through that, you feel great. So just keep going and keep training with consistency. You know, you, you can't slack off, so to speak. <laughs> you got to do it every other day, I would say, or every two days. 
and really put in the work, you'll, you'll make it. The real estate market has been worrying investors since the end of the pandemic, with the Federal Reserve's rate hikes impacting housing prices and demand being at all-time lows. Now, earlier this morning, August pending home sales index fell 7.1% from July, hitting its lowest level since April of 2020. Our next guest argues the real estate market is in a capital market recession, not a fundamentals recession. Let's bring in DWS Group co-global head of real estate, Todd Henderson, to discuss more. Thank you for joining us this morning, Todd. So break down the distinction here for our investors who are watching? Well, the, the state of, of the market is very interesting. As you said in the headline here, we do not believe that this is a fundamentals recession. Um, fundamentals are as strong across three of the major sectors as they have ever been. Uh, vacancies, leasing activity, etc. Um, in both the or all in the industrial, the, resi uh, the residential and the retail sectors, the office sector, much has been spoken about. It's challenged um, and it is the most challenged sector. But when you look at what's happening in these three uh, traditional sectors of retail, residential and industrial, we have really low vacancies. Granted, we had earlier this year or late last year in the industrial and residential sector, we had deteriorating demand. But we felt like that was really the result of a COVID hangover, where demand was brought forward through COVID. And now the good news is we're starting to see the trend lines of continued uh, uh, growth in e-commerce, which helps the retail sector or, and the residential, I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, industrial sector. 
which helps the industrial sector demand. And we're seeing, uh, again, absorption of apartment units at the level we saw uh, prior to uh, the turndown and the significant delivery of uh, new construction uh, here over the last several quarters. So we feel like while the 10-year is bouncing around a lot and real estate is priced uh, typically off the longer end of the curve, we feel like for the most part, the repricing in real estate is done. The fundamental story is strong and we feel it sets up for good rent and NOI growth uh, in the latter half of 24 and through 25 and beyond. Where do you see the most strength when you say the fundamental story is still strong? I mean, our viewers see this and say, look, if you're looking from a residential perspective, sure, there's new construction there, but these rates are really high. Is it enough for me to get in? I mean, where do you see the strength of big drivers moving forward? Yeah, so on the residential side, uh, there's, a, there's a fundamental challenge here with housing in the U.S., and it's a lack of supply. It's not necessarily the case globally, but in the U.S., there's a lack of supply. Um, there is a significantly deteriorated uh, existing home sales. Uh, existing home sales, uh, owners are trapped, if you will, in their homes because 85% of the of homeowners today have fixed 30-year uh, uh, mortgage rates below 5%. So they're not going to trade their homes and trade into a 7-plus percent mortgage, which has resulted in further deterioration of supply, home builders have started to see a, a lot of demand just because of the lack of supply. Uh, and unfortunately for home builders, they eliminated much of their land inventory at the end of last year and laid off their, their teams in the expectation that high rates would deteriorate their ability to perform and deliver um, earnings to their shareholders. So what we're seeing is a real shift in terms of demand for rental, uh, whether it's single family rental, whether it's multifamily rental. Uh, this area, we think, combined with uh, the high cost of housing, uh, you know, housing prices, they've come down a little bit, but they haven't come down materially to reflect what's happening in mortgage rates. And that's, again, because of the lack of inventory. But the costs associated therewith um, makes it much more economical for people to rent. And we believe that uh, the rental market will, uh, it's already rebounding, and we believe that it's going to continue to rebound strongly as the Ford supply curve in rental housing uh, also mm -hmm. is diminished materially. Now, obviously, still some uncertainty when it comes to the inflation picture here. Uh, Chicago Fed President Goolsby saying that housing will be key to continued inflation progress in the next few quarters, with risk that rising home prices could also boost market rents. How do you then break this cycle, then? If Obviously, if, there's low, if people can't afford to get in these houses, they don't want to move because interest rates are so high, but then that's also fueling inflation. What breaks this cycle? Yeah, well, I think if you look at... at the core PCE, the trailing three months, if you annualize it, it's about 2.6%. I, I do acknowledge the fact that we are seeing some higher oil prices. We're seeing higher fuel prices. Uh, we, we have the potential for housing prices um, to uh, stay high, given the supply and demand imbalance. But I think <clears throat> what, what, you, what you see here is the likelihood for a rate environment to be higher than what we have grown accustomed to over the last decade or, 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 or so. And I, the question in the real estate market, the commercial real estate market, is whether or not uh, the, the rate environment that we're in at the moment is the peak rate environment and whether or not pricing in the marketplace reflects that, that rate environment. I, we believe that uh, the 10-year being this morning in, in the rate of or uh, in the in the uh, in the zone of of uh, mm -hmm. of three point six um, uh, sorry four point six percent um, that uh, we believe that we're going to trend back closer to four percent and we believe that the pricing in the marketplace reflects uh, the cost of capital and again we get back to the fundamental story if the capital markets recession is for the most part done. Um, finally, Todd, really quickly on the commercial real estate sector or the office space specifically, I mean, we've heard all the doomsday scenarios that are out there. But as you think about the reality of workers not necessarily returning to the office in the way they did pre-pandemic, what does that real estate footprint look like 
five years down the road, 10 years? How are you looking at that? I think CEOs um, and, and people who lead businesses recognize the importance of having people in the office more than not. Uh, their uh, training, collaboration, uh, education, uh, we call it osmosis learning or creative collisions that happen in the, in the hallway. These are important things to the, to the sustainability of creativity and growth in businesses. I think in five years, we will see um, much more, uh, uh, much closer to where we were in terms of pre-pandemic. I don't say we would be all the way there in terms of occupancy in five years from now, but the real question is how do we get there? And getting there is, um, or before we get there, it's, it's painful. Uh, we're seeing, um, you know, <laughs> we're, we're basically seeing a significant oversupply of office, not too different than what we saw in the retail market before uh, the pandemic. And what needs to happen is uh, some of these office, some of the older office, uh, the office that doesn't offer you know, an, a, a, you know, creative opportunities, it doesn't offer um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of almost like entertainment abilities within it is going to suffer dramatically. But I think from a macro perspective, what you really have to look at in terms of office space is where are people moving, where is population migration, where are job growth, and then what is what cities and locations have the newest, best office stock in those markets. And that's how you play the office market, either from an equity or credit perspective, uh, until we get back right. to a place where you know people are in the office uh, four days a week. True. It's certainly a changing dynamic and those in the office space certainly going to have to keep up with some of these changes to attract investment. Appreciate you joining us. DWS Group co-global head of real estate, Todd Henderson. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, well, let's get you a check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. Looking at session highs across the board here so far, the Dow currently up about 130 points. The S&P 500, they're also up just over half a percent there, driven by materials this morning. And the tech-heavy Nasdaq, they're also up about half a percent or about 70 points. All right, all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Goldman Sachs analysts and top executives from across the technology, media and telecoms landscape are gathered in San Francisco for its annual Communicopia and Technology Conference. Next door is doing some pretty cool things on the AI front with our assistant and also with Vitality. For us, it actually starts to unleash unique data. We are the local knowledge graph. So I think the value of what we do starts to really shine forth. We're the only platform where you're finding out what's going on around you locally in real time. So with that data, we can do things like on the platform, help a neighbor compose a post in a way that is more engaging. So the assistant or the AI actually does that for you. There's lots of interesting discussion we can have around AI. So we announced just this morning, uh, Zoom AI Companion, which is our answer to how generative AI is gonna be included in our platform. And there's all kinds of really cool features that come with that for our paid subscribers. There are things like Chat Compose, if you're in a chat thread and you wanna be able to respond to that. There are things like Meeting Summaries, which after the fact help categorize and, and capture not only what happened in the meeting, but also the true sentiment. I think any creative would admit that AI is transformative to how they think about and how they concept new ideas. So I think it's gonna be very exciting. It's still early innings and we gotta figure out how to do it right. There's a lot of hype in our industry. I think this may be underhyped. I think it impacts things at so many levels. It impacts how we interact with computers and how they seem personal. It generates how art and media is created. It, it's a really a breakthrough in computer science and it impacts not only the products, but it impacts how software is created. There certainly needs to be a lot of debate about AI and journalism. 57% of newsroom jobs in the United States have been lost. We're facing uh, another wave, in this case a tsunami potentially of job losses uh, because of the impact of AI. And, and these are not ju just jobs lost, but it's insight lost. It's important that all media companies uh, understand the impact, but it also it's incumbent on the big AI players to understand their impact. We launched Intuit Assist. Uh, and Intuit Assist is really a personalized, intelligent uh, assistant in your pocket. Uh, it's also uh, powered by AI-driven human experts uh, so that 
when you are getting assistance from Intuit Assist, if you ever need to talk to an expert, no matter what it is that you're doing, you're able to do that. So there's always a gateway uh, to help. AI is gonna change this whole industry completely. And so we're thinking a lot about how do we use AI to match people a lot better um, and to support the conversations that are happening. I think conversational AI is also a big opportunity because people do produce all these messages. So helping them craft those messages, make it easier to communicate, I think is, is something people will really appreciate as well. Tesla is heading to trial in California today to defend a high-stakes lawsuit claiming that its autopilot system caused a crash that killed its driver. Now, the outcome could have serious implications for similar pending cases and the fate of the driving technology itself. Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan has the details for us. Alexis, what are you watching? Hi, Rochelle. Yeah, so this California state case, it's the first in a string of lawsuits against Tesla that is involving a fatality and its autopilot system. So the big deal here is this is a fatality in this case, and a jury is going to decide this case. It's a wrongful death claim alleging that a Model 3 owner, his name is Micah Lee, that he... Alexis, you just mentioned a string of legal cases that Tesla now faces around autopilot. To what extent does this California case set a precedent for the other cases to come? So I think what's important here is this is a case involving a death. So that's kind of a first time that Tesla is going to be having to defend uh, those high stakes here. Uh, certainly a case involving a death, a jury is going to take very seriously. And uh, so it could be somewhat of a bellwether for these other cases that are coming along. So it's going to be very important to hear what the jury thinks about liability. Uh, it can be difficult for a position where a jury has decided that uh, the, the the product that they made and the way they put it out into the marketplace uh, was it was a problematic or defective or that they knew that there was a problem and didn't do anything about it. That's the kind of thing that Tesla won't want to have happen here because that then can be a catalyst for other lawsuits, not to mention drive up settlement costs in order to uh, put these these trials behind them. So certainly going to be uh, impactful and something to watch as far as Tesla's valuation okay. because they have staked so, so much on this autopilot capability. Okay, well, I'll be watching those arguments and I know you will be too, Alexis. Alexis Keenan, 
with that very latest around Tesla's latest legal hurdle. Well, the United Auto Workers Union continues a strike, I should say, with Detroit's big three car makers being slow to come to any consensus with the union, particularly with both Stellantis and General Motors. The union's president, Sean Fain, reiterating that the strike will expand to more locations if workers' rights and demands are not met. Our next guest says that at the heart of the UAW strike is a lack of empathy in corporate America. Let's bring in Jennifer Moss, workplace culture strategist. Uh, Jennifer, good to talk to you today. You know, these companies would certainly argue, look, we are a publicly traded company. We have a duty here to shareholders. So we're talking about just cold, hard numbers here. Where does empathy play a role in all this? It plays a significant role when we look at the fact that the last few years have been really difficult and that people are feeling exhausted, high levels of burnout, the highest level of mental health disability claims. And then particularly in this uh, sector, we're seeing extreme high levels of exhaustion and depletion. And when you looked at the turnover in the workforce last year, 41% of the global workforce turning over, reshuffling, leaving, the number one reason was lack of empathy and care from my employer. So it's a big reason why people leave and it also plays a role in why people stay. And we are seeing a little bit of ground perhaps being made, according to a report by Bloomberg, saying that the UAW is targeting at least a 30 percent pay raise versus the 40 percent that they were pushing for. So there does seem to be perhaps a little bit of leeway um, if the UAW ends up confirming this report. But what do you think corporate America then is missing in this discussion about really making up for a lot of the concessions that really started back when the, the big three were bailed out during the financial crisis? Well, the, the, I think the most frustrating part for you know a lot of the folks that are striking right now and why they're striking is that they were made promises to kind of you know play a role in helping these uh, large organizations, huge big companies, be able to weather uh, the financial crisis. And so, what's happened is that they haven't been. Uh, they don't feel like the promises have been delivered. And that reduces trust. That makes people say, what's the point? Why am I doing this? And, you know, when you bring in things like the four-day work week, for example, it seems like, you know, it was really extreme requests, but it's more to manage the fact that people are not feeling like there's loyalty or a reason for being there. And they want to have different kinds of compensations other than just pay. Pay is a priority, but they also want other types of concessions when it comes to their mental health and well-being. Uh, Jennifer, you could argue uh, the environment right now within the labor market has helped uh, gain leverage to employees. Obviously, a tighter labor market means they have a little more negotiating power. Um, to what extent, though, do some of these demands, um, to what extent is a union necessary for that? I mean, you're, we're talking specifically about the UAW strike, but, but this concern about higher wages, better benefits, you know, more safe for employees, that's not exclusive to the UAW. No, it's not. But we're we are seeing record numbers of work stoppages. I mean, it's just astronomically, you know, um, increased since even pre-pandemic. But in the last year, we're seeing this increase in unionization. And a, a reason for that, and why we see that increase, is if you look historically over time, is that employers are not listening to their employees and feel like they can take advantage of that. And we know there's a tighter labor market and some employees are getting what they need. But when you have you know, a, a sector that, again, for a long time, hasn't seen those pay raises, has not seen those promises delivered, they are going to require or need or need to lean on a, a body like a union to be able to preserve those rights. And that's why you're seeing, again, the writers strike and lots of different kinds of unionization activity happening. Um, and instead, we could prevent a lot of this if we were just listening and being empathetic and finding out what our employees needed before it had to hit these kind of catastrophic responses. And as you mentioned, seeing this rise in, in different unions really trying to make up for, for the cost of living then, wh where do the solutions come from? If, if some of these companies who perhaps aren't as big as a, as a GM are saying, look, we can't afford to, to pay you more while we're also trying to deal with competition and, and AI and everything else, what, is about, what about the breaking point for some of these employees who are trying to balance, you know, trying to bring their companies and, and stay online with this new technology while they're also having this demand in a tight labor market for employees who just want more money and want better, obviously, working conditions as well. 
Well, what we're seeing now, and, and I contribute to the World Happiness Policy Report and what we found in even in 2018, 2019, people would take less pay for higher work-life harmony balance um, for different types of compensation that is more around flexibility and you know the four-day work week. So those folks and those employers that don't necessarily have the ability to increase pay substantially will ask your employees, okay, what are your top priorities? How do we create some personalization? How do I do some um, some supporting of you in your life and what you need? Someone, you know, that is, say, a, a middle manager that has uh, kids at home, she's a mom, is going to have different needs than, say, a new grad or someone just coming out of college ready to start work. If we have those conversations, especially we can when we are a smaller company, to figure out what is going to make someone feel excited, motivated, productive. And a lot of those things are actually free. Those support systems are not going to cost you a lot. And that's how we factor in. Let's look at the whole person, not just at pay or not just at one uh, component of their experience of work. Yeah, certainly the, the entire work experience becoming a more holistic view that a lot of these companies are having to take. Appreciate you taking the time this morning. Jennifer Moss, workplace culture strategist. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, Shopify partners with yet another company. This time, it's a unicorn. Now, Shopify is investing in FAIR, an online marketplace for small businesses to purchase from independent brands around the world. The e-commerce site is valued at $12.4 billion. To tell us more about the partnership and what this means for e-commerce, FAIR CEO and co-founder Max Rose joining us now. Great to have you on the show, Max. Congratulations on this partnership. Um, so talk about what FAIR then will do for some of these people who are, you know, obviously coming from Shopify, trying to understand how this benefits them as an independent or small business. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, we are incredibly excited about this partnership. I think for us, there's a few components of the partnership that we're really excited about in, in terms of what it means for, for our merchants and for Shopify's merchants. I think, first of all, it's just an incredible endorsement from one of the leaders in the commerce space. Shopify is a, a company that we've always looked up to, uh, and them viewing us as the leader in the, the wholesale space and recommending us to, to their merchants is really a testament to, to the fact that, you know, what we built is something really enduring and is something that a, a lot of merchants are getting a ton of value from. I think the second thing that we're really excited about is we're going to be building a much deeper partnership with Shopify. We already have a bunch of integrations on both sides of our marketplace. We serve both retailers and brands. Uh, retailers come to, to buy products from, from brands. Uh, on fair from a, a wholesale perspective. And we already have integrations for both of them. We're going to be deepening those integrations and making life a lot easier for our retailers and brands uh, as a result of this. And then the third thing that we're excited about is Shopify has millions of merchants all around the world. They have retailers that use their point of sale system. They have brands that you know obviously use their, their website for D2C. And this is going to be an opportunity <clears throat> for the brands to, to learn about fair uh, and for the retailers to learn about fair and for you know, we have hundreds of thousands of retailers and brands today. We'd love to get to a point where our community is, you know, the same size as Shopify. Uh, Max, you know, uh, given the scale of FAIR, you've got a pretty good pulse on where a lot of these independent business owners stand. Um, at a time where we have been hearing that because of higher costs, consumers are increasingly pulling back on discretionary spending. What's been the conversation you've been having with a lot of these independent retailers, concerns they have with this broader macro environment? Yeah, I think that inflation over the course of the last couple of years has definitely been a, a challenge for, for all small businesses. Uh, I think the benefit that smaller retailers have over you know, some of the big box stores is they're, they're just a lot more nimble. They're able to buy products you know, 30, 60 days uh, before they actually need to sell them versus when you're placing huge orders as a larger store, you have to buy nine, 12 months in advance. And the flexibility, the nimbleness of these retailers and, and their ability to use FAIR to, to find products, to filter by price point, uh, has really enabled them to meet the needs of consumers. They've been able to trade down uh, and, and figure out you know, what it is that consumers want in a world where inflation has increased. And you know, FAIR, I think, has, has played a big part in that. And, and to follow up on that sort of macro backdrop, um, you know, the U.S. is your biggest market, but Europe is your fastest growing. Is there something in the dynamics at play in Europe versus the U.S. that's making that your fastest growing market? And what would it really unlock that same value in the U.S.? 
Yeah, the biggest driver of our success in Europe has actually been the fact that we started in the U.S. There's a lot of demand in Europe for U.S.-based products, and there's actually a lot of demand in the U.S. for European products. And the fact that we already had all of these U.S. retailers, you know, hundreds of thousands, we've already had almost 100,000 brands in the U.S., that's proven to be really attractive to European retailers and brands, and it's allowed us to get off to a really strong start in that market. Uh, Max, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, the IPO market potentially thawing uh, with the recent uh, public debuts of Arm. We saw Clavio, we saw Instacart. Um, you know, whether in fact some of these VC-backed startups who are kind of been waiting in the wings, this is a good time to be testing the market right now. You've got a $12.4 billion valuation right there for FAIR. How are you watching the public markets right now? Is this an environment you'd want to come into? Yeah, it's not something that we're paying a ton of t attention to right now. We're much more focused on just trying to create as much value as we can for our retailers and brands, which again is one of the reasons we're so excited about this Shopify partnership. The the fact that we're able to partner with such an amazing uh, company in order to, to make life easier for our retailers and brands, that's the thing that really matters for us at the moment. All right, we'll be keeping an eye out uh, on any IPO buzz that we see around FAIR, though. Appreciate you joining us. FAIR CEO and co-founder, co Max Rhodes, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Well, after the controversial changes to Delta's frequent flyer program last week, the CEO is rethinking it. Delta Airlines chief executive Ed Bastian saying the company went too far with the sweeping changes and will be announcing modifications in the next couple of weeks. This comes after Delta tied frequent flyer status to spending and limit or eliminate lounge access for credit card holders. Um, Rochelle, I mean, this is one of those stories that you knew the day it was announced it would just prompt outrage. People take their miles seriously. And Delta though, really just following in the footsteps of American Airlines, which has made that change to say, look, it doesn't matter how many miles you travel, it's about how much you spend. Now, worth saying Ed Bastian hasn't said specifically what he's going to walk back out of those things he announced. But mm. there is, I think, a broader discussion to be had around this, that airlines are increasingly moving towards building out an ecosystem. It's not just about profits on those routes and selling tickets. It is about building out an ecosystem where not only you book your flight, 
you do your hotels, you do your car rentals. That's kind of what Delta is going for. And that's where the industry has been headed. I mean, it's true, but if you're going to have a loyalty program, people want to see their loyalty rewarded, not just their spending. I mean, you had a lot of people who had, you know, top tier status and that was their way of getting, you know, those first grade upgrades, you know, cutting in line and things like that and free check bags, priority boarding. But what was interesting is just how much those qualifying miles when you did have to spend started to jump up. So to get them the medallion diamond status, which is the highest. In 2022, that required 15,000 of these medallion qualifying miles. In 2023, 20,000, and then they proposed it being 35,000 starting in 2024. So basically making it even higher for people to be able to get into these lounges and enjoy these perks. So people were like, well, why should I have to sign up for like a card partnership with American Express as also part of that ecosystem? Why is my loyalty not being rewarded? So, but it's interesting. We haven't heard the details on the changes, but clearly they're responding to the backlash. I will say, just on a personal note, I do get miles off of my cards. So my credit cards, I used to have a United card. I got miles off of that. Since then, I have switched over. So I have a Chase Sapphire card where every time I spend money, I accrue miles. To me, that seems to be a better system so that you have a little more mm -hmm. flexibility. Of course, my dad would argue that he's a 1K member at United. He wants every single mile log because he's been a loyal customer. So there's an even split for sure. I don't know how you see it, Rochelle. I mean, I definitely, it does, it's definitely an incentive when you're picking credit cards and things that you're going to do, seeing that you're going to get those perks for hotels and for flights. I mean, yeah, it, it edges out the competition here. But then if you have to have these super high thresholds, even to enjoy the perks, if you have the card and you show up to a lounge and you're tired and they're like, no, sorry, we're going to need a bit more from you in order for you to come into the lounge. I mean, it feels like a slap in the face. It's, it's hard enough that, you know, People are, you know, pinching their pennies at the moment. Airfare, even though it's started to come down a little bit, still very high. So then to then add that extra element of then having to suffer when it comes to your loyalty points, it's, it stings. It, it hurts in a special place. The lounge is a nice perk. I agree. If you get to the airport early enough, right? I mean, it, it feels like it's a more pleasant experience than just hanging out in front of the gate. Um, but I, I do wonder with the credit card, you know, for example, being able to board early, I mean, how often is that line really long? Because everybody has the same credit card. You know, at that point, no, that loyalty true. or whatever perk that you have feels like it doesn't have as much meaning because you can sign up for it, not necessarily have to travel for it. And I, and I think that was actually Delta's point. It's like that line in The Incredibles. If everybody's special, nobody's special. So I think that's why that's part of the reason they tried to go for this. But yes, backfired somewhat. We'll see what changes they end up making. Well, shifting gears here, looking at Meta, and at its annual conference yesterday, in addition to officially launching its new headset, announced a number of new AI features, from chatbots with personality to stickers. Now, the push is a likely play by the social media company to attract Gen Z, but will Gen Z bite? Yahoo Finance's senior tech reporter Ali Garfinkel joins us now. Will they bite? Is it cringe? What are we talking here? Rochelle, I went out and pulled five experts to try to answer this exact question. We know Gen Z is an area of massive interest for Meta. It's a key part in their existential battle with TikTok. Can Meta bring in Gen Z users? And these five experts I pulled are pretty mixed on whether AI is really going to move the needle on that. And part of that goes all back to consumer behavior that we know about Gen Z. For instance, a lot of experts were saying, look, Gen Z is more likely to try a chatbot than any other generation out there. However, because they're digital natives, because they've been online for so long, because they grew up online, they also are more likely to be skeptical. The reality is Gen Z is this incredibly attractive market. It's about 20% of the US population. And McKinsey research suggests that they are actually spenders, even in market volatility, they're willing to spend to really enrich their daily lives. So the fight is there, the consumer behavior, the jury's out. We know Meta has made plans for Gen plays for Gen Z before that have worked. We need to look back to Reels for that, for example. Insider Intelligence says about 200 billion daily Reels are being played right now. That is still lagging behind TikTok, but it's major progress. In the end, what I'd say here is Meta's existential battle with TikTok for Gen Z is not only still going on, but AI will play a part of it, a part in it, but it's a question of how much of a part it will really play. Ali, those chatbots, though, uh, just one of a, a slew of products, AI experiences that were announced by Meta. Um, to what extent are they able to compete in their products with 
some of their other rivals. We're talking about Alphabet, uh, Microsoft. What did we learn more about how Meta wants to shape the AI experience? What I'd say at Eco is Meta wants to make AI fun. One of the most striking things about the presentation was that it was really focused, for instance, on AI stickers, really, really homey kind of ways to use AI, not just the chat bots, but a lot of the stickers are, well, pretty cute. They're meant to attract Gen Z. It really actually goes, it makes me think of threads and how Meta has sort of positioned threads as this Twitter alternative that's going to make you feel good. What I'd say is Meta's trying to sell AI right now that makes you feel good. Okay, we'll be watching to see how the market receives it. Ali Garfinkel, as always, thanks so much for that. Let's do a final check of the markets before we let you go. Going into uh, the afternoon session, we've got green arrows across the board right now. The Dow is up 171 points, the S&P 500 up 34, and the NASDAQ up 138. That does it for Rochelle and I in this hour. Uh, we'll be right back here again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern.